listening to the bomb hole. Bomb hole podcast. It's going to be very hot. It's going to be very uncomfortable for everybody. <laughs> the bomb hole. We're going to slide down in big hills. You know what I mean? On a big, nice, burgundy snowboard. Okay, here we go again. Another beautiful day in the booth here at the bomb hole, which is presented by Pub Beer and Liquid Death. Now, first things first. Stony Buds, how we doing? So good, my dog. Always, always, always love hearing that. To my left, it is a real pleasure. We have Salema Masakela in the booth. Salema, how are we doing? Fan fucking tastic, man. I'm in the, I'm on the bomb hall. <laughs> like, this is crazy. I'm 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 highly, highly honored. And also, I can't believe you got that go sample in your intro. It's so good. Oh yeah, we had to dig in the we had to dig in the crates for that one. Now, uh, before we, we get into it, um, for the people that have been living under a rock that are unfamiliar with who you are, um, you know, we all grew up watching you on the big screen. So ba- you, Basic cable. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> True. AKA the big screen. Uh, so, you know, a man who needs no introduction, but we're going to give him one anyway. Salema is the voice of action sports. He's a beloved journalist, broadcaster, producer, activist, musician, and avid surfer. No, he's known for hosting the X Games for 13 years, his work at Red Bull Signature Series, his coverage of the 2010 FIFA World Cup, his Emmy Award-winning series on Vice, and hosting E's Daily 10. Aside from all these notable ac- accomplishments, it's the way he carries himself as a human being that is truly inspiring to myself and Butts. But uh, with that being said, obviously everybody knows who you are, and I think the, the first thing that we should talk about is your is uh your dad you Masakela, because uh you know I think to understand where you are we gotta understand where you came from I think that's super important and uh, if you want to paint us a picture of what your kind of upbringing was like around him, wow well thank you for that uh, this is a very humbling intro and it's so weird when you hear the things you've done like all in one paragraph because just like you guys I mean you do a show right you put it in the can. And you move on to the next. And other people tell you about, like, how rad it is. But, like, you don't really have time to think about it that way. You're like, okay, what are we, what are we doing next? What are we doing right now? Um, and, yeah, that's it's just crazy that I've, gotten to, that I've gotten to do that much and that I'm still here and still doing it. So, thank you. Um, my pops, man. I grew up with uh, – I grew up with a very interesting – Life. I was born in Los Angeles, uh, but raised in New York City. My mom moved to back to New York when I think I was like one and a half or so. My dad was a musician. He was a, a political exile from South Africa during the apartheid regime, which was a, a very uh, sort of genius, insidious, legalized system of racism in South Africa that, you know, a minority of white people ruled all the other people with melanin in their bodies. (laughs) And uh, it it limited your movements. You know, as a black South African, as a kid, you know, my father had to have a passport, basically, to, let's say he wanted to come to Utah from Los Angeles, like like I did today. He had to have a, a passport and a book that was stamped with the reason for why he was there, what the work was, and when he was leaving. And a policeman could stop you at any time and ask to see your passbook. And I'm actually being probably too generous with the distance. It, c- it could literally be like from Salt Lake to, to, uh, to Park City, you know. Excuse me, you there. Why are you here? Let me see your book. Oh, you're not supposed to be here. Jail. Or worse white and black people weren't allowed to recreate together. I could be in your house to work, but I couldn't be your guest. On and on and on. It was horrible. My family was moved out of there. They, they had their house torn down, and they were moved into townships just for blacks, and they moved white people in. And so, you know, navigating that as a kid was tough for my dad. My dad loved music. Um, he was playing shows in, in the underground with like secretly with white musicians and then playing like the 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 black shows he was allowed to play but like he wanted to be a, a thriving musician and he spoke out musically against apartheid and the police were looking for him and long story short he moved to 
he had an opportunity to leave through a, 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 a priest who was his benefactor, who, who was the person who first put a trumpet in his hand from his school. And he went to London. And then um, Harry Belafonte made it possible for my father to come to New York and go to the Manhattan School of Music. So he has this crazy career um, that, you know, he's playing with Dizzy Gillespie and Miles, and these are all his, his contemporaries. And they're like, hey, man, this bebop stuff that you're playing is cool, but, like, we want to hear you play your shit. So he started fusing his, like, tr- his South African music, traditional music, with jazz at the time and sort of, like, formed this new sound. Moves out to L.A., explodes, has this huge hit called Grazing in the Grass in 1968, and then his, he just ex- number one song for 13, 13 weeks, I believe, that year. He headlines the Monterey Pop Festival. It's just, like, his life changes. Um, this immigrant kid who's, you know, wants to go home but can't. So it was, it was an interesting duality for him. And he meets my mother in, in Los Angeles. My mother had moved from New York to L.A. to go to school, and she, my mom's a very, very beautiful woman. And so, like, they saw each other, and I, my, my dad had a mutual friend, and my mother, because of the cosign, got with him. And um, they had me. But my dad was a rock star. And he was partying like a rock star, and he was doing all the great drugs that they were doing in that in that day in the late '60s, early '70s. And um, at a certain point, my mom was like, "Yeah, this was cool before we had the kid, but this doesn't work for me. I'm gonna go back to New York." Um, so we moved in with my grandmother in Staten Island, and my mom got remarried when I was about four. And my father moved back to, from L.A. to the city to be closer to me. And my earliest memories with my dad were when he'd come get me on the weekends were to go to shows with him. You know, I got to see him. I'd go to the club till like, 3 in the morning with my dad as, who's playing, like, two or three sets a night, you know. And it was, it was amazing. Like, my father was, was never really, like, a dad so much as he was the homie. Which had its ups and downs, but the ups of it was I always got treated like an adult, you know. So like I, I got to be in in these jazz clubs and you know with musicians and be backstage and see how adults acted and you know people were were smoking weed in front of me and I just thought it was natural. That's what everyone's parents did, but <laughs> clearly not. <laughs> and um, it was uh, it was really cool to have that kind of a dad, you know. And I, I traveled with him in the summers. You know, I, I had a very much different type of life at home as a kid. Um, my mother, m- my stepfather was c- extremely conservative. Uh, he was a Jehovah's Witness. And my mom became a Jehovah's Witness. And so by default, like, when I was at home with my mother and stepfather, I was literally, like, going to church three times a week, going and knocking on doors on Saturdays and Sundays. And then when I would be with my dad, it was a complete other rock star life my stepfather was um did pest control you know he 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 he, he was into bugs and my mom um, was a makeup artist and then she got into holistic health so it was a really it was an interesting sort of way to like i found myself dancing between like who to be i was a different kid with my mom and stepdad than i was with my dad um and as i got older it definitely became, it was harder to, like, navigate and find that line of, like, who are you? Like, it's so funny that you have that, that, uh, that saying that, you know, don't, don't know the key to the success, but the key to failure is trying to please everybody. And I was trying to please everybody. That literally was my MO. Like, my, my deal for survival was, like, adapt, try to please everybody in the room. Be, be who you want. Like, I'll be who you want me to be. Yeah, I'll right? be who you want me to be. Mm-hmm. Be was very much um, my deal. And it it, uh, it served me for a time um, until it was no longer sustainable. And I didn't really come into that until my, my 20s. But um, to answer your question, you know, I got to do rad shit with my dad. You know, he would disappear for a few years and then he'd show back up and like, hey, I'm on tour with Paul Simon on the Graceland tour. 
Um, you should come and see me. Like, all right, cool. Go hang out, meet Paul Simon. Paul's like, you should spend more time with your father. Do you want to come on the road with us as a to Australia and, and Europe? I was like, there's no way my parents will ever let me do that, Paul Simon, but thanks. <laughs> Full name. And my dad, uh, I remember him saying, Paul saying that to, to my dad. My dad laughed. He said, there's no way, man. His mother's a killer. You'll never be able to convince her. And Paul's like, well, let me talk to her. I was like, oh, good luck. So we're at Madison Square Garden. Um, actually, Radio City Music Hall. We'd gone to see my dad. It was the first time I'd seen my dad in like four years. Uh, he had been living, a little bit of backstory, he had he got homesick. He needed to like have his feet in African soil. He, he tried London, New York, L.A., but he was feet, like he had all the success, but he was just like, he was depressed. And he couldn't go back to South Africa, but he could go to Africa. So he just went on this pilgrimage, and he was like in Nigeria and, Liberia and Botswana and Zimbabwe and you know he's hanging out with Fela Kuti and shit like which as a 10 year old you don't really understand you're like where's I, I saw the last time I saw my dad was like at my fifth grade grand graduation he gave me a saxophone because I had been playing clarinet and he was like you gotta play brass man so he gave me an alto sax and then I didn't see him again for like four and a half years and so it was such, such it was such an interesting pivotal time but Paul was not bullshitting and he took my mother aside and after a show and I saw him talking to her and just watching like just going like what is happening and sure enough he walks over with my mother he's got this big smile and my mother's just blushing and beaming because she's she's been a fan of Paul Simon since you know forever and um I look at her like what's wrong with you and he's like, he, she tells me, and she's like, I think it's a great idea. And when we get home, we'll talk to your stepfather about it. But I think we can make this work. I'm like, what? Paul, Simon, you goddamn Jedi, you. <laughs> sure enough, we get back home. I'm living in New England at, at this point. We had, we had moved to New England when I was 13. And I remember the fight that my mother and stepfather had. It was like loud. And, you know, you know that one where you're, like, down the hall, but you don't want to be too close. So when the door opens, it looks like you were listening. And so it gets a little bit quiet. I sprint back to my room, pretend like I'm doing something, and my stepfather walks in. And he's just, like, just, he's so sad. He's like, well, your mother tells me that uh, this is what you want to do. And um, I guess I can't stop you. And I just remember being like, <gasps> don't show how stoked you are. Just, like, be chill. And then he walked out of the room. I was like, yes! And, um, you know that movie, Almost Famous? Mm hmm Yeah. That was me. 15, 15 and a half, on the biggest rock music tour in the world at the time. Full send. Like, people ask me if I went to college, and I go, no. I did not go to college, but I did go on tour with Paul Simon during Graceland, and that's all I needed. Most life-changing experience ever. Holy shit. Well, now I'm curious about this because you grew up, I, if I'm listening to you, I'm thinking about the fact that you're sitting, watching your dad command an audience of thousands and thousands of people, and you're sitting there and they're mesmerized by your dad. And, you know, if we fast forward and get into your career broadcasting, you know, you you just seem to have a gift where when you when you start talking, your voice is calming and your verbiage and everything like that. Now, what I'm kind of wondering is, was that learned or do you think that was something that you just naturally inherited by watching your dad do his thing? It was a combo platter. A combination player. And it's an interesting combination because, yes, I watched my dad and was learning osmosis. You know, just repetitively watching and seeing what's possible in the way he commanded an audience. And the key for that was that my dad never talked down to an audience. He never, 
my father was standing on the stage, but he was eye level with everybody in the room. That was his gift, was to connect and make people feel like it was an exchange, not you came here to, like, worship my abilities. We are here in exchange. We're going to create an energy and a vibe. And he would learn about every place that we went to. You know, like, one of the things that I loved about touring with my dad is that when we got to a city, he'd ask the locals, like, where do the locals eat? And, like, I want to go to the grimy spot. I want to learn about what makes this city this city like where are people struggling you know what what where where are the people who are oppressed as a person who came from oppression and then he would translate that in his stories and how he dealt with people from the stage you know and even like when we'd be out in the streets and he'd get recognized like people walked up to him like they knew him because that was the vibe that he had so i definitely definitely learned that from him to you know not take the uh, not take this opportunity to put myself up here you know i i when i finally did get these opportunities to get in front of the the, the camera it was just because i was a f- like a a rabid fan of this thing that had changed my life and i was just doing everything i could to to not have it taken away from me so this next logical step where it wasn't even logical but this happy accident that I got in front of the camera was like don't blow this and also like let the people know that like we're here I'm just as psyched about what you're watching as you are and we're going to do this together the other part of it was that because of how strict my church was I always had to like learn how to give these prepared biblical talks and my stepfather was like an orator like he was a, a congregation elder and he was, like, notorious for, like, his storytelling and his ability to, like, take a parable and, like, whittle it down to something that, you know, you could digest and think about in your life. And listen, a lot of it was rooted in some crazy-ass propaganda, religious propaganda that had you, like, in fear of death at all times. But it was my normal. I didn't know that I was in, like, a pseudo-cult, Christian cult until I kind of, like, got older. But... That repetitiveness of having to, like, as a kid, get up and do those kind of talks and learning how to pause and learning how to, like, build an arc in your message so that you could get someone to listen when you went to the door to knock on the door to sell them everlasting life. Those two things between my dad and what I was doing in church because of my stepdad, they intersected and... I really do believe that they gave me, like, a a weird, like, X-Men-style skill set that I still don't know how it works, but I, I th- 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 those things come up in me when I need them. Holy shit. That, yeah, that, that X-Men, that really makes a lot of sense when you look at both sides of your upbringing and creating the, the kind of broadcasting juggernaut that you've become that is just a complete... Uh, wordsmith and now that we're in this space right buds and I kind of we analyze like uh, we're on the same playing field as far as we we talk for a living right mm. so we're, we're always chatting into microphones and so you can pick up on when somebody is so goddamn good at their craft like yourself yeah, you're mesmerizing and, right and, and so w- what my question to you too is like you're you're aside from the cadence and the tone and the things you learned um, and the arc of a story that you just described, but you're so well spoken with your vocabulary, and I'm curious as to how did you sharpen that tool too. The vocabulary thing is interesting because that was another thing that came. Well, my dad was was super worldly. You know, like he studied all the places that he went to and learned about what made them work, and he was an he 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 had like lots of like poet friends and writer friends and like you know po- political friends and so I'd go to these homes and he wouldn't like send me out to go play with the kids he'd sit me at the table and make me listen and so you're picking up on that and then in church like the way these things were written and the way you had to speak it was all about vocabulary was all about like I had to sit and read the Bible like a New World's translation like 
over and over and over again. So you you're you're dealing with all these different types of 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 of, um, of messaging and vocabulary. Um, and I had to learn how to be very convincing on stage when essentially like making a biblical argument mm-hmm. of, of sorts. So, you know, being around lots of different types of people and then like at the same time growing up and being a, a, a kid of hip hop, you know, in New York City and like growing up with like Method Man and like being around hood kids and knowing that like just because you're learning like all these great big words and shit that doesn't mean that shit is it's not going to apply here so save that and like be at eye level wherever you are as opposed to walking in the room and and listen you know like I had to really learn how to listen as well so I never really think about the uh, vocabulary thing but people say it to me all the time like where'd you go to college I'm like (laughs) I barely graduated high school like, I found out that I was graduating from Carlsbad High, my fourth high school. I went to four high schools. Um, two days before graduation. Because I wasn't like a, I wasn't a great student. I was a social butterfly. Like, I was into people and I was curious about about the good time with schools where I went to, like, hang out mm-hmm. and, and be social, you know. Um, but it wasn't, I also didn't have aspirations of going to college because my that was something that was for like forbidden for kids who were Jehovah's Witnesses. Like you, you, you learn just enough to be able to like work enough so that you could dedicate yourself to the church. And so college wasn't really the thing. So I didn't, I wasn't, I was never really thinking big picture that way. And I read, you know, I can, I've always read and continue to read. Um, and maybe that help helps sharpen, but I'm curious about language. Like I'm curious about any, any ability to be able to like extend uh, the ability to connect and communicate. That's fascinating too, because I think a lot of times intelligence, especially with the general society, a lot of times is associated with your degree or your college background, or like you said, somebody asked, where do you go to school? But you know, for lack of a better term, it's like, it's kind of all street smarts in a way. If, I don't know. There's probably a better term for it, but it's kind of cool how you just learned through living, not through like conventional school and, and still brought up and still learning. Mm-hmm. Never going to go to high school in Staten Island at all. Um, I went to junior high. Is that, did you meet method man then? Is he in your school? Yeah, we were in elementary and junior high school together. Wow. I've been watching that Wu Tang show. Yeah. That's, that's I got pictures with him and I when we're Clifford, like, is that his name? Clifford Smith. Yeah. Clifford Smith. Clifford Smith had one pair of pants. Yeah. Is that how he rolled? <laughs> yeah, man. Like he came from nothing. I got a DM from from Method Man like maybe 10, 11 years ago. He'd come on the show when I was at E on the Daily 10. We reconnected after I left New York. I didn't see him for, you know, but we were like, we were close in, in, in elementary and junior high. We were in the same grade together, same classes together for like six or seven years. Um, don't see him. Move to New England, then move to California. I come home one one time from work. I th- it was I think I was like I was probably like twenty three or so, and um, you know everyone's sitting around drinking beers, watching MTV, and Wu Tang videos on. This is ninety four, and I'm looking at the TV and I was like, I know that dude. You know, all these kids. I had three roommates at the time. No way. You don't fucking know that guy. I'm like, I know that dude. That's Clifford Smith. That's Clifford Smith. Like, that's Method Man. I'm like, that's Clifford Smith. I know that dude. Sure enough, I run home to my parents' house, find the school pictures, clear as day, jawline and everything. Like, what? Are you fucking kidding me? This is crazy. Fast forward like five years, and I get my first gig at MTV doing the MTV Sports and Music Festival. That was my first, like, big television gig um, outside of, like, Planet X and Board Wild. And they're like, We're, you're going to do skateboarding, and Method Man and Red Man are going to be your co-hosts for Vert. I was like, what? I was like, uh, <laughs> so, yeah, I, I know Method Man. They're like, no, you don't. I'm like, yeah, I, I, went, I went to school with him. 
we knew each other as kids, but we haven't seen each other. They're like, that's amazing. Do you have pictures? Bring them. We'll put them up on screen. We'll make it a surprise. So the day before Vert, they want to, you know, introduce us. Standing backstage and just this big cloud of ganj walks in, a bunch of dudes. And there's Meth. He's like, like, shoulders down, you know, it's just like, you know, 94, like backpack hip hop, like that energy of like, I don't know you, so don't, like, until I fuck with you, don't fuck with me. And uh, they're like, um, Meth, <laughs> Red, this is Sal. Uh, he's going to be your, your co host, da 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 da. Uh, for, he, he, you know, on the skateboarding side, and y'all are just going to have fun with him. And I just look at him, and I go, yo, Matt, my Clifford is Salema. And he just goes, oh, shit, Salema, my dude. And he just comes out of his shell, gives me the biggest hug. He's like, yo, this is my man. This is my man's from PX6, PS16, IS61. What's good, fam? And we're, we're back and forth, and next thing you know, I'm sitting in a van with him, Capadonna, Method Man, and DMX, and they're passing around these gigantic Louisville Slugger-style fucking blunts, and I've never been higher in my life, to the point where at a certain point, Actually, I didn't even realize DMX was in the in in the van. It was like a, a white like production van, sitting there telling stories. Red Man's got this bag of cassette tapes that he carried with himself everywhere, like a bodega plastic bag, and he's just running like live DM run DMC shit and like rock him shit. And you're like, what the fuck is happening? Mike Carter was with me. Mike Carter, who who I think ended up like starting Electric. But he was like the only white dude in the van. He's like, what am I doing here? And um, at a certain point, like, I just, I'm out of body experience. I've never been higher. And I just hear, yo, yo, you're fucking up the rotation. <laughs> and I'm like, huh. You, you just get, get out of that, like, that, that, that stony fucking tunnel vision. And I turn around and it's goddamn DMX. He's like, pass that shit. Pass that shit, son. I was like, ah, I'm sorry. Surprised <laughs> he didn't bark at you. And um, yeah, but anyway, uh, you, a few years later, I got a DM from uh, from Meth came on the E show later on. We put the pictures up. That was a few years later, and then one day he hit me up. He's like, Yo, remember those pictures? He's like, Can you send me them? I was like, Yeah, no problem. He's like, My family didn't have. We couldn't afford school pictures and so like seeing those school pictures like brought back such memories of how poor like my family was and what we didn't have and i'm just so hyped that you have those i'd love to have them be able to, to have and i was like yeah no problem and i and, and i sent them to him so yeah it's crazy one how do we get there that's an unreal that's uh, unreal it doesn't even matter how we got there yeah. that's just incredible so another thing along these lines, though, you're talking about the uh, what was it called the MTV Winter Sports Festival? Yeah, the, the the first ones were the MTV Sports and Music Festival. Yeah, and then um, they started doing like the the seasonal the the sports and music ones were the summer ones, and then it was like I think they called it Board Blast mm -hmm. was the winter one. But those were my that was my mm -hmm. first introduction to the mainstream television audience. I had done a show called Planet X that was like a public access show that this guy Don Durbin did, and then that led to Board Wild. Um, and both of those started, I think, 95 was the first one I did at Planet X. Planet X. Remember that uh, that first, like, stadium snowboard jump contest they did in Denver? Mm -hmm. That was the first Planet X event I ever did. <sighs> so yeah. What I'm kind of curious about on these on the lines of this because this is like nowadays we have we have X Games, we have U.S. Open, we we know what a big snowboard event looks like. It's taken seriously. It's in the goddamn Olympics for Christ's sakes. Yeah. It's like <laughs> right. So so if you if you run it back to to like those days, it almost seemed like snowboarding. Like I was actually watching some old archival footage of 
of yourself. And it's like, it's kind of like this radical, like, whoa, these snowers are kooky and fun and wild. And yeah. Like, and like, kind of like this, it wasn't really respected as like a thing, right? Can you talk about what that yeah. looked like back then? Like going to, uh, the MTV thing was, was such a interesting conflict because they clearly like didn't care. There were people there who cared about the culture, which is how, and they fought for it to get on MTV. Carl Harris was was really one of those main dudes. But once you got to MTV, they're like, whatever. Like, we want to get to the music. But it's the Sports and Music Festival. So they brought in people like me to be with, like, Carson Daly. I would be co-hosting with Carson Daly and basically explaining to him what was going on and then, like, him or one of the other VJs would say some like wild, radical, extreme shit, and then you try to like, you know, parse it out for for like the audience, audience, and that's actually where I first started learning about like, okay, how do I explain this in a way that's like still gonna make the homies happy, but also um, reach an audience that's seeing this for the first time. But the the first shows that I did were they were all pretty much renegade. You know, like the Planet X show was a renegade show. We didn't have like the, the guy Don Durbin was just a hustler. He was like an OG, like content and flip it guy. So we would just show up at events, and he'd take advantage of the fact that I knew everybody there because I worked in the industry. And you just like hustle some, shoot some B roll, do some interviews, give people a sense of like what it felt like to be there. They'd do some bad music montage <laughs> of shit that went down, and but you were stoked to see that on television. Like, any time there was shred shit on TV, even if it was, like, 10 years old, you, like, called your friends, like, yo, we're on TV. You didn't, we're on TV, right? Because the only people who cared about snowboarding at the time were the people who did it. So it was such an interesting thing in the, in the when it made that leap. Like, when Trans Old Snowboarding got to, like, 300 pages, right? And everyone and their mother was advertising in it. There was this, like, it was like a, you know, like the old popcorn you put in the microwave and then just, it was like, oh, that looks, it's amazing. And then just went into some other shit that no one I, I really think was, was prepared for. Because snowboarding events were just put on by the homies. So we were all learning how to do production, right? Do promotions. Um how to event plan, you know, how to liaison with, like, with um, the city or the police or whatever it is. Whatever we needed to do to, like, make the thing, make the party happen, because it basically was just a party, that's what you did. So those events, when I think back to, like, what the West Beach Classic was like and, you know, I mean, even the first time that I went to the Open just as a spectator was like, oh. This is our, sh this is like our shit, you know, even to like what the, the vert ramp at the trade show represented at, 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 at ASR, like those sessions were like, that, those, that was hallowed ground, you know, because it was the, again, it was, it was just the culture moving it forward. So when you got into these spaces now where Madison Avenue realizes, oh shit, there's money in these hills with these with these freaks that we thought were just like fringe like they're actually dictating what the culture is going is looking like and mainstream is is looking over here for inf for influence that's when all the money ran over and suddenly we you got real sponsors right you got the swatch tours and you got you know I think one of the ones I did was that the the, the Smirnoff Big Air that was my first real big tour. But I, I was doing all those things just on the mic, not in front of the camera. So I think that was the other thing that really helped me was like being someone who learned to announce at the event strictly for the people. Like I would never have gotten on the mic if Dave Duncan wouldn't have put like co-signed me at the trade show because he that, that was his zone. And I would go and sit next to him and just like, and one day he was like, I, I got to get some food. Like, can you take over for me? And I was like, uh, yeah. And he's like, hey, everyone. You know, like, and then I found my groove 
And if the skaters liked you, then you could keep talking. If the riders liked you, then you could keep, they dictated who was on the mic. Like at any event or contest, if like the person who was talking was whack and the riders were like, get that person out of here, you're done. And you're not picking up a mic anywhere else because the next place you went to, people heard about how shitty you were. So whenever, like, when the phone started ringing and people being like, hey, we're doing an event at such and such and we'll give you, you know, lift tickets in a room for the week. What? Yeah, I'm there. In a heartbeat. Like, because it was about getting to be a part of the thing. You know, we were in, man, that mid-90s for snowboarding was the, was the, was the greatest thing ever. Because there was, no one was looking for a mountaintop. Everyone was just looking to keep the dream alive, you know? And there was no comprehension of where we were going. Right now was always the best. Like the moment, the homies, the exchanges, the after party, like the next morning, like let's go. That right now was everything. And so when it suddenly got to the point where like, oh, people are like packaging this thing up. And, and it wasn't just in snowboarding's control anymore. It became a very interesting line to walk. And for me, I never thought that it would, I, I never thought that I'd end up in a place like ESPN or something, you know, from MTV. I could never have pictured my credibility or my, like, authenticity or my passion and genuine love for the culture getting called into question as a result. And, and those were very, very interesting times to suddenly find yourself in the eye of the microscope by a huge audience who was like, where'd this guy come from? He's not one of us, you know? But... Um, did that specific... Like, yeah, can you can happen? you explain that scenario? Because I'm unfamiliar with it. No, I mean, I think that's when, like... Man, I just walked into, like, a whole other zone. But, you know... I started off as a sideline reporter at X Games at at um, in '99. You know, a guy walked up to me at Van Triple Crown of Snowboarding in Breckenridge, where I was with my team at Alpha Numeric. Alpha Numeric was a clothing company that I got to co-found um, in uh, in 1998, and I put together a snowboard team. And I was at the event with uh, with the team, and I had been like the, the 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 stuff that I was doing, Planet X, Board Wild, MTV. Those were just little like side hits. It was literally side hits. The run was a career in the in the industry and working at brands. After Trans World, I went to Planet Earth, helped develop their whole snow snow thing with with Chris Miller. I had Dave Lee and Blaze Rosenthal that I brought on the team. Shout out to, shout out to the uh, the most OCD, former vegan, now fine artist, Blaze Rothenthal, also like illest style in the history of mankind, and Dave was just salt of the earth. But the interesting thing was that that's how I met Kennedy at MTV because Dave had just started hanging out with her before they got married. Anyway, wow, I'm just you know save it for the book, but um, Crested Butte. Was my, was my first X Games, and this guy walked up to me at, at uh, a few weeks before at Breck, and he's like, "Hey, are you Sal Masakel?" And I said, "Yeah." He said, "I'm I'm Phil Orleans. I'm the executive producer of snowboarding for the X Games." And I said, "No, you're not." And I stood up in my bar stool. It, it was after the contest, you know, like post bar scene, raging at like six o'clock uh, in Breck. And I'm like, "Whoever put this fucker up to this?" Ha ha, fuck you. He breaks out a card, very nice card. Oh shit, you, you are who you say you are. We start talking, we go into the lobby, we talk for like four hours. And he's explaining to me that X Games wants to bring in like, he's bringing a, a bunch of credible voices in instead of like stick and ball guys who are doing what you were describing, extremifying everything. We want to make this legit. Are you down? And I was like, absolutely not. Here's everything I think sucks about the X Games. And I just, you know, I was speaking from the perspective of being a snowboarder. I didn't really have an interest. It was cool to see the riders and your friends and us on TV, but, like, 
I was like, this is not what we do. And I went back to work that, that Monday and I told everyone at, at, at Alpha America, you know, what happened and that I said no. And they're like, you did what? <laughs> you did what? The fuck are you thinking? Aliasha Moore, the brainchild behind Alpha America, he was the one who was like, yo, you could change that shit. You can make a difference. You can be the voice for us. Like, if they call you, you better do that shit. And everyone was like, agreed. Like, yeah, you don't get to cop out. And the dude called me. And two weeks, two weeks later, I was on the side of the pipe doing a live. I'd never done live TV before. But you, it's your friends coming down. And now they're smiling when they take off their goggles. As opposed to like, oh, what what kind of question is this person going to ask you? And it's happy times, you know. I'm I'm in the the now I'm feeling the festivity of being in the thing and like, oh shit, this is this is actually kind of cool. And the the way the athletes reacted, ESPN was like, oh, this is different. And at the end of that event, they were like, do you know anything about skateboarding? And I was like, yeah, I do. Can you be in Virginia Beach for? this what such and such B3 qualifier in a couple of weeks. I'm like, sure. And that's how it began. But I had no, I had no aspirations of making it a career. It was just like, Oh, this is cool. Until a year later, like this is a career. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, fast forward two years later, I'm doing all the play by play for snowboarding and skateboarding. And I'm the host of the whole X games. Like, they groomed me. They put me in seminars. I learned how to broadcast. I learned how to... I went to these journalism st seminars with, like, all of, like, the baseball, football, et cetera, people. I'd fly out to Bristol, Connecticut for, like, three or four days and, like, go to ESPN school with, like, ombudsman who's, like, explaining exactly why we have to, like, tell stories this way with journalistic integrity. Your passion and knowledge of your sport mixed with journalistic integrity so that you can be inside for the core people, but also explain this sport to the masses who are watching it for the first time. So it took all that other stuff we talked about at the beginning that I had naturally, right? And now, now here's a, a, a system to be able to run it through to translate that to the world. And it was, it was the craziest, wildest journey ever, as also the totality of our culture, like, and the manner in which it is intersecting with anything else that's supposed to be cool is exploding at a rate that, like, is incomprehensible, and you're here in it, and you're like, wait, what? what, what, what what's happening? You know? Extreme burgers. It, the shit was crazy. And I'm just going as hard as I can to try and, in my mind, I rep for the culture, um, and then suddenly, like, you know, you get to the point of social media and shit, and people are like, that guy's a kook. He's not a snow. There's no way he's a snowboarder. Like, he doesn't come from the thing. And then you're like, oh, that's right. You weren't here for, like, <laughs> <laughs> you weren't here for how I got here. And it started fucking with me. Like, you know, people say, like, oh, you don't pay attention to those things. But we all know that, like, that – now that we've we've been in social media as a part of our lives for you know 12 13 years like you you have to reckon with it like you got to learn you in order to get to like ignore it you got to walk through what it's like to think that it's real and i way all of a sudden was like oh, is this what people think about me i didn't realize that people were just bored at home and pissed off and maybe like legitimately like envious that this person they've never seen before who also doesn't look like anybody else that's on the screen is doing this thing. I remember when people used to walk up to me and be like, it's pretty cool that ESPN taught you all that shit, dude. You've done like, it's, you've done a good, because you don't ride or anything, but how do you know all the tricks and like, you know, the guys? And I'd be like, the fuck are you talking about? Wow. You know? But like, that's what suddenly like, being outside of the realm of, like, the core of the culture when you suddenly find yourself out there and out of, like, the protective realm of, like, the you know, the people who are ride or die for this thing. Um, yeah, it gets very, very interesting. You know, another thing, too, though, also when you start, like, kind of identifying a lot of times where the emotions come from, too, as you're talking about, the, it's like, you know, the, like, hate. Like, where does the hate come from? And, like, in a lot of situations with somebody like yourself who's, 
getting fame and things like that. Like envy can be like the deeper root below that or, you know, and, and things like that, not to go like full Dr. Phil fucking psychologist, <laughs> Johnny on him, heavy. but it, it is. Once you start getting like in the limelight, you know, and, and people kind of tearing you down, I don't know. I think that you maybe have something they want. So, you know, there's, there's probably layers to that as well. But. Yeah. Once I learned that that's really what it was about, I just fell back because I, I took a really good look at, let me take a look at my life here. And you're like, oh, yeah, I get it. Because I'm, shit is amazing. <laughs> I'm out here. I'm on the Tony Hawk tour. I'm doing shit that I never could have ever imagined. I, I understand where you might, if you don't know my background and I'm not a pro, you, I could see how you'd be confused. And every time I come on the face, be, I'll come on your screen a certain a number of you be like, fuck that guy. To this day, I had a guy, a guy who was a lifty or he, at, at Jackson, he posted something on IG, on IG on one of my stories during natural selection. And he's like, it just said, kook, you're a fucking kook. And every once in a while, you're like, let me see what's happening here. Oh, not a private account. Go a little deeper. Wait, you work he you 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 work at Jackson Hole. Like that's this is your job. Like I can see you. Oh, I walked by you a couple days ago. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> so I said I'm like, that's cool. I was like, I'll please bring that same energy the next time I walk by you at your job. And I don't think people really expect you to respond that way and he's like well it's just i've never cared for any of your commentating for the entirety of your career i was like well why didn't you just say that like you're the one who came out here and called me a kook just because i'm excited it's a powder day <laughs> <laughs> it was on one of the off days you know where i was just posted a video excited because the writing was insane and so yeah i loaded one up <laughs> and um and I just said, bring that same energy when you see me in the village, my mans. I'll have a smile and a hug for you. And, um, yeah, he sent me a DM and apologized. Mm. And then you realize, like, oh, okay, you were just triggered. I get it. I forget that me being excited to go ride powder and, and I'm going to do it with, like, the best snowboarders in the world might make you be like, Fuck you. Mm. He was working that day. Yeah, he was working that day. <laughs> you were shredding that he, day. He was working that day, and I'm going riding with, with Pat and Travis and Hannah and and Elena and company, and we're going we're, we're gonna to have the best time. Right. I get it. Cool. I get it. Dude, I had an epiphany while we were doing the research for this, this episode. And if you look at, you know, we were talking earlier, both like football. You know, mm -hmm. if you look at football, I'm going to use a couple of references or hockey, right? Hockey has Doc Emmerich. Football has Al Michaels. When he's on hockey, he's Collinsworth. He's not like <laughs> <laughs> he hates on the Patriots too much. But if, if you if you look at if you look at action sports, straight up, the it's it's Salema. We have Salema. Like it's kind of. Have you ever have you ever thought about that? No. It's that's that's a that's a real thing. that's a real comparison. That's such a very strange thing to hear. Um, a, a certain there was an article once. I think it was Woody Page. Woody Page called me the. Um, I think he, he 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 called me like the oh he called me the Bob Costas of action sports. And I'm I'm like you're. You're Woody, you're Woody Page. Like, what do you don't? Why? Why would you say that? <laughs> why would you say that? <laughs> and he afterwards he said to me, he's like, man, it's not even my world. But I know that, like, if I'm if when I think of a, a voice or an authority, who a voice that I I mean, a for, authority is like a voice that I trust in this thing that I don't know. It's you because. You're the person that I see, and you explain it to me in a way that I learn. And he was just like 70-year-old sports writer who said that to me, and it was super, super humbling. And, you know, to hear you say that is, again, it's like, I just, I've never, 
I literally, I just think of it of like, do I still get to keep going? Like every year, if the phone rings or the, a contract gets renewed, I'm ex I'm just grateful to be here because this all started from getting the infection of the thing. You know, Scott Forbes gave me a skateboard in Massachusetts and in a town that was built with built on football and a bunch of like very weird like conservative um f you know suburban folks when no one looked at me like me it was four punk rock skateboard kids that made me feel like I didn't need a click and Scott Forbes gave me a skateboard then I moved to California and I discovered surfing in my school the first week Justin and I took me surfing changed my life then I got a I started hanging out at Hobie in Oceanside, which is now a store called Surf Ride, but it was the only place that tuned snowboards, like tuned snowboards and put snowboards together, and and skate surf and snow culture all had the same, that was the one shop where like it was all the same tribe, and everyone did all those things. I learned how to put together snowboards. I learned about snowboarding. I I went there and watched videos, and then I went snowboarding, and that was just like that was in '88. The first time I went snowboarding, I was in fucking. A, a body glove full suit in Sorrell's because I didn't have the stuff, but a wetsuit kept you warm. So <laughs> Holy shit. Should a body glove wetsuit. A, yeah, a wetsuit. Is this that Big Bear? It was Big Bear at Big Summit. Bear. And it was like, oh, well, a wetsuit keeps you warm. I guess it should work. <laughs> I would like to see <laughs> some footy, footy. That would be priceless. There's, there's pictures. There's not footy, but there's pictures. And then my neighbor lent me a jacket, a green Lang uh, jacket. I looked like the, the supremest kook <laughs> with some bad bull A's. And it was that we went night boarding and it was bulletproof. But I had so much fun. And I just thought, this is amazing. And none of my, all my other friends were like hardcore surfers. So they all kind of like drifted off to the side and went on holidays. But I hustled to get up to that mountain in any way I could. I had a neighbor who was a rep for Bolet. He had a big Bolet truck. He found out that I snowboarded. He put me in touch with the woman who ran oper marketing operations. He said, go to Summit, go into the marketing room, ask for this woman, give her my card. He wrote a note on the back of the card. I'll never forget this. She looked at me, looked at him, called him to make sure it was real, and she was like, you're good. I was like, what does that mean? And she handed me a ticket. She said, whenever you come up here, just come here. I couldn't afford to ride, but my neighbor hooked it up so that I could go in. This is way before the industry. And I got a job at the snowboard shop at, at, at Hobie, and I was tuning boards, and that was my shit. And I learned how to snowboard by going up there and just watching people do shit. And then occasionally someone would be cool enough to be like, you want to ride with us? I'm like, yeah. And that was it. Like, I was in. You know, I, I, I didn't have, like, enough gas in my car to go, but I would hustle and be like, I should be able to make it back. And I didn't eat, but, like, I went riding that day, and it was amazing. I dislocated my shoulder, and I don't have insurance, and I'm driving home stick with one hand, with my, le with my left hand in my lap, because I can't hold the steering wheel, and I'm shifting, and it's icy, but, like, I still got a smile on my face, you know? It infected me. You know, it just, I, I it, it, when I graduated high school, I wasn't thinking about going to college. I was just like, how do I stay close to the thing? And my family was like, what is wrong with you? You know? I was waiting tables, bussing tables, I was... I was a janitor. I was cleaning car dealerships. I, I used to clean all the uh, car dealerships in Car Country Carlsbad at night. You know, I cleaned offices. I did construction. I did everything under the sun so I could just stay close to the thing so that I could surf and I could snowboard. And, you know, by the time I was 21, 22, my, my family was like, what? 
even my dad <laughs> was like, what the fuck are you doing, man? Like, <laughs> you know, your mother's, com you, you were all concerned. He's like, I know your parents are square, but like, I understand where they're coming from. So you got to find a thing. Like, what do you, you want to do? And I said, well, I just, you know, I love this thing. And I'll never forget it. My dad is the reason why, I, why, why I've never let go. And I've stayed tenacious with any opportunity that I got on this journey. He said to me, he said, if you love this fucking thing the way you, I think you say you do, then you better fucking find a way to get inside it. What do they do? Like, are you going to be a pro? What are you going to do? Because you better find what it is and, and, and attack it. Because right now you don't look cool. You don't look cool at all, man. And it's sad. And I was like, oh, shit, the coolest person on earth just told me I'm not cool. But it lit a fire underneath me, you know. And so when I was waiting tables at the Potato Shack in Encinitas and Chad Denena came in, Chad Denena, who founded Nixon, but at the time was at Trans World, he came in with a bunch of other people and everyone was wearing trade show badges. And I was like, yo, my people. It was a Sunday, and our restaurant, you know, 40 minutes to an hour and a, hour and a half, one of those breakfast, breakfast places. I'd leave with $500 cash. I would work at night at the Belly Up till like 2, 3 in the morning, sleep a few hours, come in on Sunday. But between those two, I could have like $800 cash on a weekend. So that was part of my hustle. And then I would like pick up shifts at the bank during the week and have my windows to shred. I was living a very cool life in my studio apartment, no car and a hot plate, but I was happy as fuck. Chad's like, so first of all, that table, it wasn't in my section. Greg Whipple, who's now a highway patrolman from Canada, he was a volleyball dude, stud. You know, those, those people who walk into a room, you're like, God damn it. You know, six foot three, all the stuff. The genetics, girls would come in and be like, oh, my God, I hope he's our busser. <laughs> and uh, I was like, you don't, dude, I need that table. That's my table. He's like, nope, no way. That looks like a, he had the, such a dry Canadian. He'll be like, no way. That looks like a good table. I can make some money on that table. <laughs> and he goes, five bucks. I go, what? Five bucks and you can have the table. I remember looking over at the table, looking at Greg, he's dead ass. Gave him five bucks. All right, you can have the table. I'm maybe going to make five bucks on this table, but I just paid five bucks for the table. Why? I don't know. I just felt like those were my people. Sure enough, they're telling me that, you know, they they work at Trans World. What the fuck? And they're going to the trade show, et cetera. I'm like asking and peppering them with questions. Chad started coming in regularly, and um, I would always take care of him. Coffee, extra orange juice, no charge, bro. Got you. And finally, he just goes, what are you doing with your life? Like, what are you doing? I said, I don't know, man. You know, just like, you know, doing my thing and, you know, I'm able to like just kind of do enough to shred. He's like, yeah, but what are you going to do? <laughs> <laughs> he said, you got the personality to be in this industry and like you clearly love snowboarding and surfing and skating. Like you should work in the industry. And I'm like, yeah, that would be amazing. But how? Breaks out his card. He says, we're hiring, um, I'm, I'm, I work in advertising, and we're hiring a junior ad sales rep. Call me tomorrow. You're going to come work underneath me. <laughs> Get home. Just sit with the, the, my, my roommates. I tell them, they're like, that's insane. Because they were all shredders, but they all had jobs. I was so shit fucking blown away by the thing that I actually didn't call Chad for like two days. I was actually petrified. Like, this can't be real. Finally call him. My roommates were like, call him. Call him two days later. And he's like, dude, I, I told you to call me Monday. We hired somebody. He's like, you fucking blew it. I got to go. I hung up the phone like, oh, home. Sh shit, sh fuck. <laughs> sh shit. You know, like devastated. He calls me two days later and says, hey, our receptionist decided that she wants to go back to school. 
she's only going to be able to work part time. I can't make you any promises, but if you come in here and hustle, maybe you can find your way, but you're not going to be working for me. Like that's gone. So junior ad sales rep, like think about that at the time, like commissions, the coolest job in the building at Transworld. You remember yeah, facts, <laughs> you know, also we fucking work together at Transworld, my yeah. guy. <laughs> Um, and that's gone. And now it's like, come in here and answer the phones and hustle. And that was the moment, you know, I went in for the interview, got it. I remember that first day I sat at the front desk and I'm like, Transworld Publications, how may I help you? And Chad told me, you hustle, you go to editorial at both the, the snowboarding and the skateboarding side. You ask people what they need done. You come to my department, you ask people what they need done. When you're not on the phones, you're doing something for someone else in this building and people are going to see what you have to give and you'll find your way. And that's when I took that advice from my dad. And I, from the second I got that opportunity, I never looked back and I never fucked up ever again by like being too scared to go after the thing. Yeah. One day late on that call. It's heavy. Okay. We're going to take a break to talk to you guys about our sponsor manscaped. Now, you know, these things are basically, it's like a beard trimmer, but it's for your bush. Um, you know, we've talked about before, uh, Bud's, he, his bush, from what I understand, it used to be an absolute disaster. I actually now use the number two length on it, and then I use no length and carve a bomb hole logo in my bush. Oh, you've been going <laughs> bomb hole logie. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> now I got to ask about, you know, the touch of gray. Are we, is it, is it work on oh, gray bushes? I'll tell you what, contrary to belief... The gray, the bush goes gray last. Okay, all I have right. A little gray in the beard. Allegedly, None. I would say allegedly. None for legal below purposes. the waist. Yeah. Okay, allegedly. Okay, so also they have the crop cleanser. We use it as hand wash. Actually, uh, I take that back. I did find one or two gray. <laughs> I plucked them. I plucked them. Oh, I okay. Seen any. Right, he goes back pluck. to the hand wash. Okay, back he goes pluck. Wash. Okay, so yeah, we use the crop cleanser. I got it right here. Um, this is basically hair and body wash, and I've been using it in the shower. Wash my hands. You smell great. And um, I'm, I'm happy with that one. Dude, I'll tell you what. In the Performance Package 4.0, they got the weed whacker in there. And I, they don't really tell you this as a kid, but as you get old, crazy hair start growing out of weird places in your ears. Like Dude, Yoda. Like Yoda's got that Like going Yoda's on. ears and a couple people I've seen on airplanes with this mysterious bush growing out of their <laughs> ear. This thing is waterproof, 9,000 RPM, motor-powered, 360-degree rotary dual blade. I don't know what any of that means, but damn it, trim the ears on that my sounds like That sounds like a performance package right it there is. is what that is. It, it kills it. Now, if you're interested in picking up a great gift for yourself or somebody else, head on over to manscaped.com and use promo code BOMBHOLE. Again, manscaped.com. Use promo code BOMBHOLE. You'll save 20%, and you know what? That supports us, you're supporting the show, and you're also supporting your bush or potentially your hair. And if your bush goes gray, just trim it. Well, we've been going for about an hour, and I think it could be a good time uh, to kind of put you in the hot seat with a little, little bit. You know what, bud? Name that video part. Name that. This is name that video part. I'm going to so suck. This is where I, this is where I get to, like, really... Enjoy. I'm just gonna be like, I'm 50. I don't remember. Chris is pretty generous. Okay, we'll see. Name that video part is presented by the Icon Pass. Now, snow has already fallen. There's snow on the ground in some places. You do not want to sleep on getting the Icon Pass. Why is that, buds? You don't want to sleep on owning the stock. That's why. You do, in fact, want to be an owner of the stoke. Why? Because they have locations all over the world. Where they got them, buds? There's 45 destinations worldwide in five continents, nine countries, 15 states in the U.S. of A alone. That's a lot of locations, as we like to call them. Now, head on over to IconPass.com and pick up your season pass for 499 USD. Pretty good deal, right, buds? Best deal out there, I would say. Absolutely. Again, head on over to IconPass.com. And what are you going to own with that, buds? The Stoke, my friend. Absolutely. So, um, you know, I was gonna, I was searching for name that video part, and uh, I was kind of, I was gonna do some contest stuff, and then I was like, I almost did like perfect one hundred run. I go, what is this? Because, but anyway, we went with a video that you may or may not know. So, what's your confidence level zero through ten? One. Okay, here we go. Ooh. Good song. Great song. Great tune. 
give you some little. Uh, is it absinthe? It is not absinthe, but I could see it. Let's say, um, you may have been. I could be wrong about this. You may have been in cahoots with this person's <laughs> brand with Alpha Numeric. Okay. Jamie Jones. Ken Block wasn't. Is Ken Block in? Oh, one? so that's a right. So there's a hint. Uh, Mountain Lab. DC yes. Mountain Lab. There it is. Yes. Okay. Yes. yes. We right, got him there. Yeah. There. There. there it is. So, yeah. and you're also in the DC Mountain yes, Lab. Yes. So I, I thought you might know. It. Uh, you got yourself a bomb hole cooler. Yes. Filled with bomb hole merch. You got a mug. Sick. Uh, the top. There's a little button on the top. Thank you for being so it's kind as to make full. it. Low hanging Back fruit. Yes. They can hardly oh wow, this is up. amazing! Yeah, everything in there available at bombhole.com. We got some stickers. Are we got you bumper stickers? You know what sucks about this is I'm gonna have to protect it because I have so many friends that are like bombhole groupies that they're gonna try. Mm -hmm. They're gonna try for this. Well, Thank you. I know you, you got an. I know you, show. Yeah, you got an Emmy. I so that I would put that right yeah. next to the Emmy. Yeah, if put I that right here. next to 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 the Emmy and the Producers Guild Award. Yeah, there it is. Uh, well, you know, while we're while we're dropping them, let's if just we're talking them. about awards. Well, actually, <laughs> specifically, we should put them put that actually put the cooler a little bit above that. <laughs> above if, wherever yes. those are, put it like eight inches above. On cooler, the and then those two yeah. awards those two next to it. That's perfect. Yeah, that's down, where we're gonna want to be down below. Man, Mountain Lab. Wow, those were the fucking days. Mm -hmm. If those walls could talk, if that hot tub water could talk, and it was a petri dish. <laughs> That, I'm yeah. If that hot tub water was under a microscope in a lab, and it could talk. I may or may not have have gotten uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Gonorrhea, not <laughs> 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 chlamydia. I what are we talking? That's right. <laughs> Listen, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna say it. I absolutely. Did bone down in the DC Mountain Lab. I think that was a pretty common place. Hot tub, yeah. But they had a strong filtration system. <laughs> also, we were young, and it's just what you what you did. The generosity, the generosity of Ken Block. I think you could just do an episode just titled The Generosity of Ken Block, where Ken's not on it, but just bunch of people come on and talk about how Ken Block made a difference in their survival in the thing. Like, to be seen by Ken Block meant that, A, two things. He was going to, like, be the one to constantly have a foot in your ass because he saw what your potential was, and he was also going to do, like, the craziest, most benevolent things to make sure you had a shot at seeing it through. And when he put me on DC and Quicksilver, he called me up one day and he said, hey, man, and this is a bad Ken Block. Hey, um, you know, I just think like, you know, you, I, I, I see you you're riding all these, wearing people's stuff and stuff, and it's cool, but like, are any of those people taking care of you? I was like, what do you mean? Like, they send me clothes. Like, no, like, you're, you're advertising for them. And you do a damn good job of it, so you you should be you should be taking take you should it should be an exchange. And then he just was like, you know what? I'm putting you on DC, and I'm calling Bob McKnight. And you're on Quicksilver. I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and yeah, here's a contract, and here's two years, and you're on the team, and we're making it an exchange. And like, here's the things we want you to do for us. And also come out and let's shoot some shit at the mountain lab. And, and here's a ring with diamonds in it. <laughs> you're, you're on. Full um, contract. Yeah, man. Securing the satchel. The most, one of the most important and, and benevolent stewards of the culture that we have. Like if there was a Mount Rushmore of like stewards of the fucking culture. Put goddamn Ken Block right up there hey, at man. the top. Give him the man of damn air. should be that Mount Rushmore. That'd be nice. Yeah. We should see if we can get like a, uh, maybe a sculptor to make one for the yeah. bomb hole. Like yes. A little, make a miniature like a mini version. one. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> put KB's head on there. Put KB yeah. right on so, there. So one other thing, uh, for Name That Video Part, we got a part two. This is for our listeners. You don't answer this one. 
uh, it's, so they get to comment in on Instagram when uh, this episode comes out. Comment on Salema's picture on our gram for a chance to win uh, a little giveaway prize pack from the Bomb Hole Boys. So here we go. Okay. Hi, I'm Salama Masakella, 50-year-old shredder, and I can tell you this. I started taking bubs in my late 40s, and since then, I'm stronger, go bigger, and have you seen my skin? Bubs. (laughs) Get some. Uh, And also, if you're interested in picking up some Bubs Naturals, head on over to Mm BubsNaturals.com. Use promo code what, buds? Bombhole, twenty percent. Yeah, not with a question mark though, because you said it with a question mark. <laughs> you it Just quick. use uh, promo code bombhole, <laughs> and you'll save twenty percent on uh, your Bubs Naturals. No question mark on that. Yep. I'm still trying to get my Sean Lake six pack though. That yeah, I thought he's kind of always had one of those, huh? This guy. What man. are you thinking? Sit ups or what do you think it is? He I, says it all starts in the kitchen. I think that's it does. And you got to take Bubs. I cheated this morning when I had that that uh, breakfast sandwich, but we're gonna go work that out. Oh, yeah. But I have been eating a lot healthier. I count my I I, I try to eat nothing above twenty two hundred calories during the week, and um, I don't eat a lot of uh, the carbohydrates. Carbohydrates uh, yeah. off the carbs. I eat I eat healthy carbs like sweet potatoes and and the quinoa, but I'm not pounding the bread and the pasta. I save I save that for the for the for the holidays and shit. It works. Smart. All right, I think it's a good time for another staple of the show which is, um, you know, it's presented by Liquid Death. We've been chugging them. I've had to urinate like a racehorse earlier because I think I had seven of these. Stand by. That's crisp. Love that sound. That's crisp. That tastes like the fucking mountains. Absolutely. Straight from the Alps. Salema's uh, chugging Licky D right now. Mm. Licky D. Would you say you just murdered your thirst? My my thirst is dead. (laughs) Killed it. <laughs> if you're interested in picking up some Liquid Death, head on over to liquiddeath.com slash bombhole. You'll get a couple koozies. It helps us out. It helps out the show. You know, they support the show. You should support them. Yeah. You know what I mean? And your kidneys. And your kidneys. And you don't get, it looks like you're drinking a beer. You know, like I've said it before, but I think our neighbors think I'm a raging alcoholic because I'm drinking this at nine o'clock in the morning. I do think that there is a placebo thing to the style of can. When I'm drinking a Liquid Death, like out, it does feel like you said, like I'm drinking and I'm I'm cool, and you feel good. You feel good, yeah, and you're not hung over. And in the like morning. you'll feel cool. That's a, that's another big factor. So mm-hmm. with that being said, we're gonna get into the spinning wheel of death. Here oh we go. Boy. Welcome to the liquid death. Death, death, death. Spinning wheel of death. <laughs> We actually have a new spinning wheel of death yeah, made by brand Jules. New one, Jules. I listen. I'm stealing. <laughs> I'm stealing Jules or getting a Jules. You got to get a Jules. I'm looking for a Jules. I'm actually looking for an assistant, like a one stop shop super kid who knows the past, understands the present, and is excited about the future, and has um. Content, social media, editing skills. If you want to be my like my super assistant, and you're interested, DM me on the gram. We'll do an exchange. Send you an email address to send me your resume too. But I'm serious. I'm looking for a Jules. Jules, Let's get this guy a Jules. Do you want to come to California? <laughs> Lord have mercy on the inbox on your Instagram. Yeah, you're just a, you're about up. to get flooded. Yeah. Okay, so what you're going to want to do here know. is give this thing a spin. And this also, way? also, don't talk to Jules. Don't, don't send that to her. Uh, and uh, <laughs> we will tell you what you land on. All right. Action sports trivia. Why do I think they were all action sports trivia? We rigged it. They are. You <laughs> 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 he, he knew that without seeing it. <laughs> Ah, uh, shit. <laughs> okay, we're going to test your, uh, your, I guess, action sports contest trivia. We'll see how, kind of, all, all genres. Again, I'm 50. I don't remember stuff. All right, we'll see how you do. Um, first question. 
first motocross rider to do a backflip? K Hart. And then what about the, he kind of didn't land it? Yeah, kind of didn't land it. Yeah, uh, Mike Metzger. Oh, he knows. See, there's it's a two part. It's pretty good. Uh, okay, I would say that Kerry Hart paved the way. Yes, for for Metzger. Mike Metzger. Agreed. Man, I remember when Mike Metzger did the back to backs in Philly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> both dirt to dirt, no dirt, ramp. Both dirt to dirt, no ramp, and it was like nine oh fucking nine, motherfuckers. Mm-hmm. Let's go. Also, no visor on the helmet, which is an interesting look. Yeah. Um, but you got to respect it. Okay, this is uh, another one we got here is who landed the first double backflip on a BMX? Dave Mira. That's correct. See, he's good. In the words of Ace and he's good. With my help, he could be the best. <laughs> May he rest in absolute peace and power, man. What a, what a fucking superhero Dave Mira was. Absolutely couldn't agree more. Fucking... BMX Leyunda. Um, next question we have. We're gonna get these are gonna get a little more difficult. Who won the X Games in snowboarding in 1998? Jeez, throwing gear on it. Lord. Which 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 uh, event? So when I googled it, it just said X Games snowboarding. This name. I feel like in '98 there were a few different disciplines. There was, was border cross. It, well, it would be it would be slope style. This name would be slope style or bigger. 98. Peter Line. That's, you're close. He won the year before. Okay. 97. All right. Wow. So, 98. S- these synapses are still semi-firing. Semi. <laughs> 98. Was it, was it KJ? Yes, it was. Yes, Kevin wow. Jones. Do you feel like you're on a game show and you're dominating right <laughs> Yeah, now? you really are dominating. Okay. Kevin Jones, who's responsible for a lot more shit of what snowboarding is today in these streets, then he gets actual credit for. True story. Agreed. KJ, we got to start showing you some more love on this show, too, because he doesn't... He, he, we get a lot of JP walkers. and mm-hmm. No and offense of- to JP and the rest of the Yoda out hip-hop uh, army of Shred with their impeccable stees, but KJ was doing shit in these streets... And only because he was, like, beautifully weird and not in a posse of any sort mm-hmm. that had specific steez that were of the day, he does not get the credit for the influence that he he had in that movement. And it was fucking real. Anyway. And he was winning everything. And addition. he was winning everything. Yeah. The first time he dropped that fucking 450. Four-fifths commission. <laughs> off the toes. Off the tizzies, everyone was like, oh, oh, my pearls. <laughs> that was, I mean, that was heavy. It was so, so heavy for the day. And he was casual. Like, his board control was was f- futuristic. And then, oh, let me just go and, like, chuck the fucking heaviest shit you've ever seen possible on lines that would, like, you'd, you take a firing squad of instead of firing yourself off the shit that he was firing himself off in the backcountry, but then he could come to the streets in that time. Very small, very very small percentage of human beings who could who could who could dance on both sides of the fence. The yeah, way, hardly any. Like yeah, yeah, not 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 really anyone. Well said. Anyway, uh, okay, we're gonna uh, ask another one here. Who invented the YOLO flip? Don't know. Ooh. YOLO flip. Kind of a bullshit trick, but I just want it's kind of like a contest name. But uh, the the answer is iPod. Ah, I remember that. I don't think anybody else calls it a YOLO flip no. besides him. So I think really I haven't a, heard that one. Yeah, I think it was that was a pipe trick, right? I want to say it's like the double McTwist, yeah, maybe or something. Yeah, whatevs. The YOLO. Well, okay. Uh, we, got two, we got two more nice, questions. Nicest guy. Nicest guy. Nicest guy. <laughs> iPod. You kidding me? <laughs> Nicest guy. <laughs> so you say when you have nothing nice to say about anybody. Okay, next question. Um, who who had a perfect 100 super pipe run? Controversial as it may be. And I love that it's still an argument to this day. The white one. Sean White. I think I may have even been saying the words. Yes, I was commentating that run. You called that run. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I watched it again recently, 
And I what I what comes back to me is that yes, the hand drag, but also no one could do that run then. And I don't know who can do that that run really now. Question part two. Mm. Do you know what pants he was wearing during that run? Um I think it was the tight blacks. I'm gonna go leopard. Was it leopard? It was the leopard. Yeah, I think he had leopards. I'm I'm not we're gonna need to fact check that, but my brain says leopard. Here's the thing that did Sean in which Sean did his own his own self a disservice. The stance never appeared freakish when he was wearing traditional shred clothes. Mm -hmm. But once he decided to go um, grip and rip all the way to the nuts in the steez, suddenly it was like, what's happening? Are you, is that like, did you T-bolt to both ends? And I think, I, I, I know this is, I, I think that it did, it, it allowed people to have a new conversation that had nothing to do with the fact that, like, no one can do what he does. Mm. And easy, I, I, easy to focus on the stance. The yeah. thing is, it's the elephant in the 27 room. 27 inches? I yeah. I I'd, would like to see, if, if somebody can get a tape measure on that thing, It's. I would like to know. It's impressive. Mm-hmm. But I, th- I think that because it is so foreign, especially as he's gotten older, when I, I see, the, I see the, the, the people who take digs, and it's like, listen, if he wrote at a regular stance that you approved of, you still wouldn't be able to fuck with the, what this dude can do on a snowboard. So if that's all you can talk about, it's actually the, the, the thing that he can actually ride that like that. that- that's the part. Yeah, whatever happened, it's working for him, right? Yeah. Here's the two things on that, my take on that. A, he should almost be awarded more points because it seems like it should inhibit your skill set. Yeah. Like, A, to the fucking men. And then, but B, going back to your point about the perfect 100 and, and stuff like that, we haven't seen, if you look at snowboarding competitions since Sean White, there hasn't really been somebody that's like the fucking, for sure, the guy. Like, it's been this kind of, um, you know, like leapfrog, different person winning each year, different type of thing, and and uh, you know what he what he did do for the sport is like we need our we need our superheroes. You yes, know? and yeah. and so as much as I love busting balls here or there, like we fucking he what he did for snowboarding shits on ninety percent of people because as a culture we love superheroes. He's a champion of the sport. Without Sean White, snowboarding is not what it is today. Perhaps the reach of the bomb hole isn't even what it is. And there are some people who would be like, sacrilege! <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe... Sacrilege. I was... <laughs> sacrilege! But it's... It's the truth. Sacrilege. Like, he... He Tony Hawk slingshotted snowboarding into the Nexus. Mm-hmm. And then snowboarding got to do whatever it wanted with it. Like, Tony did the 900, and then he made... He did bagel bites and all these other things, but skateboarding was like, all right, we're in the room. And did everything that skateboarding needed to do with it, right? It's the same with Sean. Like, his breaking out into the upper echelon of A-list mainstream superhero was it towed snowboarding into another place that it didn't get to occupy before. And people can say what they want about it, but, like, you cannot take it away from him in any way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. And like you said... Top of the pedestal, you know, super, super actress, superstar girlfriend, all the life that he's led. Hate, hate. Remember Chappelle used to say, hate, 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 you know, from my perspective, it seemed like you were living the Hollywood, like you were intertwined with this Hollywood world, right? Fully intertwined. But, you know, in, if we're talking about, you know, the probably the difference why some people hate on Sean and some people that don't, I think personally is because he seemed to go and just, that was his people. And then, and, and I think some people are upset because they feel as though he turned his back on, wait, you're ours, you're a snowboarder, you're our people, right? And so, and... 
inversely, you know, you never, you never did that. You're always like, you know, you've always been, you know, on, on the same playing field or felt as though you're on the same playing field with the snowboarding culture and community. I think that because of the way Sean grew up as the first child prodigy of the sport, like, yeah, there wasn't even kid sports until him. Like, the guy made it possible for, like, product to be made for kids. And it was made on his back from, like, the time he was 9 or 10 years old. His parents were the first Little League parents of snowboarding. They lived in a goddamn Scooby-Doo van and drove from contest to contest they had no business being there other than for the opportunity to Sean maybe pre-run the event and get some clips. They were thinking so far into the fucking future and we didn't even have social media yet. And it was strange. It was controversial. It, they were aggressive. I remember I'd walk by, you know, his mom at an event and she'd be like, have you seen Sean? He's doing McTwists up there. You should get up there and take a look. And you'd be like, um, um, okay. But they were, it wasn't, they, they believed that their son was going to do a thing that didn't exist yet. Like that he was the future and they put all their eggs into that basket. And I think because of how much he was thrust into the mainstream spotlight before he could, before he was even 10 years old. You forget, this dude crashed into Bob Burnquist in the flat bottom in Texas when he was like 11, Little maybe. Head. yeah. And almost died. Like, he was already that dude. He won that, that sports and music festival in Summit when he was like 12. You know, when we took him on the Tony Hawk tour, he couldn't do math. Like, we taught... Sean had to add and subtract by teaching him how to play poker. <laughs> like how to do it. I mean, I'm not saying he was illiterate, but like how to do it quickly. Like was him playing a poker with a bunch of adults. I, what I'm trying to get around to saying is I don't think Sean ever had an opportunity and I'm, to be, he never had the, he never, he never was posseed up. Like he didn't, he didn't he his family was his his posse like he he never really cultured all right and by the time like you know as he started to really come into his ascension he's a superstar it was the shreds who'd come up in a much different way than he did and Sean who's been groomed for this thing and is also like has this weird competitive chip in his brain that he's not even aware of but it's what his drive is i look at sean the same way i look at kelly slater same way i look at tony they these are these are michael jordan they're freaks kids are freak they're people who are driven by a set of principles of what's possible and it's lit specific the fuse is specifically lit by competition in a way that no one else could comprehend. That's where they go they go blank. Their prefrontal cortex shuts down and we watch them do like crazy shit and then by the time they're human again, they don't know how to like actually like social up and like be a part of the thing like I'm going to go and like obsess about the next time I see you fuckers in this thing. Like that's not what I'm here for. And that same thing that gives him his gift to con continue to defy logic and win, you know, gold medals in skateboarding and do all these things is also the thing that ends up being like a cement block around his legs when it comes to like people's argument for like, well, he doesn't represent the culture. I don't necessarily know that he knows how to or cares in the way that we care. And it's very hard for us to comprehend that someone doesn't care that way. Thus, the like, <laughs> you know, he's just built different. And at a certain point, it's just like, well, we're just going to take him for what he is because he's given, it, given us so much. It's unfortunate 
that perhaps he didn't have the ability to, you know, feel the support of his peers and feel that camaraderie of like, we're all moving snowboarding forward together. But I just, I on some like real like cyborg shit, I just don't know that he ever could access that. Also, I have a, I have a sidebar on this topic as you're talking, I'm listening. Cause it's, you know, <clears throat> we, we throw our jabs here and there at, at, or like a jab about the stance here and there. But at the, at the end of the day, I respect every little shit mm-hmm. out of Sean White. Right. You, you can't not. And when I start thinking about what I'm saying is like, essentially, I'm putting my expectation on what I expect him to be. Right. It's like, well, who am I to say, fuck, you're, you're supposed to behave in this way and put my dude, you should be able to do whatever the fuck you want. And that's what he's doing. So kind of like in some ways, fuck me for putting my expectations on him of how to behave, you know? Yeah. For me, it was different because when I took my job at when I took the job at E. I was in a really interesting, funky place. You make a bunch of money quick. You never had money before. No one ever taught you. Long story short, IRS came. Hey, looks like you've been having a good time over here. Hey, we're just here to collect. And I was like, what? And I was I was in a bad way. Tail is all this time right there. <laughs> bad, 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 bad way. And they're coming through with the fees, et cetera. And next thing you know, like, wait, I'm in debt six figures plus to the to the government? Oh, God. I guess it's time to get an accountant. <laughs> <laughs> and I was in a bad way. I had just lost my NBA deal at ESPN one season. And they were like, listen, dude with the dreadlocks is cute from the X Games. Don't bring him back. ESPN was like, sure, no problem. All I, all I thought was like my next my next deal was going to be like a seven figure deal, and I'll pay off my taxes. NBA gone. All right, cool. Wow, this is fucked up. Then the new president at ESPN suddenly was like, we're doing too much in action sports. All this other like side programming and culture stuff. Nobody wants to see that. Winter and summer, that's it. And, you know, we'll do like a little preview shows and uh, and that's it. So my overall deal got at ESPN suddenly got cut by over two-thirds. It was heavy with the government knocking on your door. And you're famous, but on paper you're you're actually broke. I'm stressed out. My accountant and agents are like, you got to clean bankruptcy and we'll start fresh. I'm like, no way. The idea of, of claiming bankruptcy to me just felt like, but I did this. I can't, I can't, like I've heard of people doing it before, but it just seems like a cop out. Something's going to work out. And then I get this call from my agent. I'm in Hawaii doing um, MTV, Kelly Slater's uh, Celebrity Surf Off. This is when he's going out with Giselle and Alessandra Ambrosia is there. Oh, it's a, my God. She's my favorite supermodel. So, kid. so yeah, this is 2005. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Victoria's Secret. Yes. Juggernauts. Juggernaut. All, all that. Just mm-hmm. superstars. Kelly's like, come down. I want you to do this. Commentate this thing. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm there. Best time ever. But also, I'm broke. I, I'm having panic attacks, by the way. Like, literally, I start dealing with, like, having crazy... Anxiety attacks to the point where, like, I had to be hospitalized, like, four times because I thought I was dying. Oh, shit. Which, prior to that, I was like, anxiety? That's not a thing. Until you're laying on your back and you don't know how you got there because you passed out from this thing, the chain reaction that's happening in your body convincing you that something else is going on. And I'm not talking about that to anybody. I'm on Ativan, this... this Anxiety drug, which makes me like, just like, it just makes me like even, but I would be like watching a comedy and can't laugh. I'm laughing inside my head, but like my body's not doing anything. But it was, that was better than living in the fear of having an attack. And I'm at a real crossroads because everything looks rosy to everybody else, but like I've fucked it up bad. Anyway, I get a call from my agent. Hey, you did a general... Um, 
audition at E! last year when we were sending you out to different networks, they're trying to find a host for this show called The Daily Ten. They've gone through like 70 people and they can't find someone for what they're looking for chemistry-wise with these women. Someone brought up your tape. They want to see you. And I remember being on the phone like, uh, that sounds like a job. <laughs> I was like, like a The Daily Ten? That sounds like, well, what's the show? Oh, it's a gossip. I can't do that. If I do a show like that, I'm going to lose all credibility with my whole thing. And now you're just like, what? Well, what do you want to do? You say you want to make it. You say you have something to give beyond action sports. Here's your chance. Fly back to L.A. As soon as you get home, go in for this. Get home from that thing. I go to the audition. They have like 12 dudes. And they had already picked the, the two women. So they're doing these chemistry tests. Every day, I get called back, come back tomorrow, come back tomorrow. Gets whittled down. Finally, that final Friday, there's two dudes left and me. I go in there, crush it with these girls. They call me on a Sunday night. You got the job. Yay. <laughs> it was a very weird thing because I was like, this is so foreign to me. It's all built in like celebrity, like gossip shit. And they're like, we just want you to do it in a way that's cool. That's why you're the guy. I'm like, I don't know if it's possible to do this in a way that's cool. And I'm literally like, well, this is, this is the price you pay for being a dumb shit with your money. You're going to do this show, but you're also going to lose your whole world. And I, now the, the anxiety is actually doubled with this new success that you're having. Then in my mind's eye at the time was almost happening because it had to, not because I wanted it to. And I start the show. It is every day. I remember the first week, I was like, when do we go on hiatus? They're like, there is no hiatus. This is the Daily Ten. You have a job. And they're writing. Seven days a week or five? Five days oh, a week. Yeah, yeah but on the, Friday. on the weekends, I'm doing um, press junkets for movies and shit and interviewing stars. And it was a yeah, real. Like on the red carpet. And yeah. Red, you're at red, parties. Red carpet or in a hotel room where they're, you know, they're, they're cycling through these actors about the movie that's coming out. And Entertainment channel. Yeah, and what it ended up being was actually a, a, a very, very real gift in that if ESPN was college, then E was grad school because instead of just doing events here and there, now you're in the shit every day and you got to write and you got to come up with jokes and material and you're testing shit every day and you got to make it feel like everyone's watching the show for the first time. Plus, your interview skills are different not just talking about shred. I'm talking about all of culture now. And getting to do that every day, by the time I went back to X Games that winter, they were all like, what happened to this fucker? Like, I thought that I was good. I was knowledgeable, and I had good energy. But I was not good. I was like, a, I was like that kid that got drafted that you show some flashes of brilliance in the preseason, but then you put him in an actual game, and you're like, oh, God, sit down. We're going to need to develop him. But because I was the only me, they, like, worked with me, and they were patient, but I was not very good. E, that shit turned me into Darth Maul with the, 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 the two-ended, the double-sided. Uh, double uh, lightsaber. The other the double lightsaber. lightsaber. I got to say, wow. for the hardcore snowboarders, too, for me and guys like J2, seeing you on TV, you were our Sean White. Our, our friend made it. There you yeah. are in the big league. So to us, it was crazy. It was awesome. It was crazy to get that reception and the homies being like, yo. Yeah. All of a sudden, our girlfriends know who's. I'm is. watching this shit with my girl. <laughs> yeah. And I, it suddenly became the show that like dudes could watch with their girl and not feel weird. And I, I kept it real as, as much as I could. And they'd let me like interview like a Paul Rodriguez or I'd figured out ways to like overlap the shit. And. It worked. I paid off my taxes. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I got over, I, I, I did the work to get over the anxiety, which was, was, which really like helped me like learn about what was important because suddenly I had this crazy fame. And like you said, I was in the mix. Very, very in the, one day you like open up a tabloid and a, a, apparently you're, you're sleeping with Lindsay Lohan because you were at a club on a dance floor with her. And next thing you know, there's a whole story that's made up. And you're like, wait, what? Huh? How did that happen? It's like Leo DiCaprio, you and someone else. Like, how? 
is this a joke? <laughs> um, but it ended up being a gift. And I think to your point, I so preciously knew that this was temporary and m- the community was, was my community without the community and without shredding, I don't get to be in this position. So I ain't going to go over here and be like, peace deuces. Like that's not possible for me. And I was very, it was so heartwarming to like have people like, yo, you're repping us. Keep going. Let's go. And it, it, it ended up being a great four and a half years. And when I went, when I got to the point where I realized like, I don't want to be, if I stay any longer then this is going to be what I'm known for. I, I knew that there was other shit that I wanted to do. And so when they, when they told me that they were going to cancel the show, um, I was not sad. I was like, Oh wait, I'm, and they still owed me a year on my contract. And they kept the other two town, ta- the other hosts and put them on E news and made E news an hour and peace out Ryan Seacrest. Thanks for the lead up every day. And, um, yeah, I'll never forget it, and I'm super, super grateful for it. Wow, that's an unbelievable uh, f- explanation of that whole period of your life. Um, fa- super fascinating, and I have a guest question. Oh, no. It's a long-winded one. Oh, boy. And he's returning the favor. Oh, <laughs> shit! <laughs> so uh, saddle up for a long question from none other than Jason Ellis. Here we go. Uh, hello, Salama, Mabama, Masakela. I'm Jason Ellis, <laughs> and this is your turn to cry, bitch. No, I don't actually have anything really sad to hit you with. Um, I guess my question is, I have two, maybe three, because I'm punchy and I'll forget that I asked two already. But uh, one is... Who inspired you to be so friendly to people and to always kind of like help people, even though I personally saw people not really try to help you kind of be dicks? I felt like people were kind of being a dick. I I took part. I mean, I've already said this to you, so I'm in the clear. I've apologized. But um, what? who inspired you? What drove you to uh, not reciprocate? cocksuckiness and fuck over a bunch of other people because they were trying to fuck you over. And then my next question is, when are you going to fight at Alice Mania? You said you were going to fight. You fucking yippity yip yap is what everybody does. But where's your opponent? What about Todd Richards? <laughs> He's kicking or, a punching um, bag for the record. <laughs> Ken Block. <laughs> that was bad. Don't record. Don't play that bit where I did that kick. It was a bad <laughs> kick. The video is a bad kick. But yeah. <laughs> um, you're just one of the nicest people I've ever known, Sal. And I guess maybe because you surf a lot, and there's like some really nice surf, really nice surf people, and maybe they inspired you. I didn't see it though. I didn't see them. I just know that you're a very friendly person. You're always helping other people, and I never noticed other people really doing that for you. Obviously, they do it now, but that's because you're a huge star, and everybody wants to swing off your dick. But when you were jack shit, you were always trying to help people. Like me. I appreciate you, mate. And yes, you are going to fight one of these days. Just not me. Remember you were going to fight me? That was a fucking bad idea. (laughs) Love you. Ah, man. Wow. That really, really, really hits me in the heart. Um, Uh... My my relationship with Ellis, I, I'd known him before, but the Tony Hawk tour is where we became brothers. And it was strange. There was like this kind of weird hazing that I got from some of the some of the guys who were like, Why does he get to be why does he get to, to have a fan base too? Um, you know, why does he get to to be a part of this? We're the ones who are like, we rip. And I, uh, it was weird. It was really, it was really weird on tour. It was kind of, it was hard, but I just kind of rolled with it. But Ellis, I always knew that Ellis was like, 
was so much bigger than that. Like, I saw the kindness of this dude's heart. Like, I saw the way that, like, he loved putting on a show for the people, and he was for the people. And he would tell me stories about, you know, his life and what he'd been through. And I just knew, like, yeah, you're talking shit. When you talk shit to me with those dudes, you're just trying to be cool. Like, I know what our friendship is. And, you know, I, I remember one time when we were filling out, like, visa applications to go to another country. And I remember seeing Ellis, like, he's sitting there. He's, like, kind of just looking around. He's holding paper on the bus. And I was like, what's up, man? And he's like, I can't read, mate. I was like, what? Man, he's like, I, I, I can't really read. And I was like, no worries, dude. Just slide it over to me. You know? And I'd help him fill out his shit. And then from then on, like, we just had a knowing, like, if you need help, dude, don't worry about all these other dudes. Like, I got you. And we, um, he became my, my staunchest, like, defender. And the person who really stood up for me f with people who thought, like, just because they were the kings of a thing at a time, that, like, that gave them the ability to, like, shit on people, you know? And it was... I watched, I just watched what, like, the way he would battle, like, each day. And he was going through shit. I mean, he talked about all of it here, but, like, he was fucking going through shit, you know. And I just was like, I know that this dude's going through shit, but he ain't, he's not the results of his, of bad decisions. So if it meant, like, you know, getting the key to his hotel room and getting him up and getting, getting him gathered and getting him packed so, and helping him get on the bus then fine, like, I, you know, I, I just, I, he was a hero to me. Like, I could never do what he did. And as far as, like, kindness is concerned, man, I just, like, that's just how I was raised. You know, my father was, my father especially, like, like I talked about at the beginning, you know, my dad, if, if, if he, you know, if it was a cab driver, and we were going from point A to point B in New York. By the end of that cab ride, he knew that dude's story and learned about his kids or something that happened to him or shared a commonality in having visited that person's country or city. And he quietly gave that person the biggest tip of their life and never said anything. You know, the way he treated everyone that worked on a, on a show, from the sound man in the front of the house to the person who was stocking the, the green room. He just was like, he wanted to know everybody's story. He was curious. And from that curiosity about people and everybody having a story, that really rubbed off on me. That was a big part of, uh, I think, shaping my personality. And I think it's what, I think it's what helped me to navigate, like, getting thrust into lots of different situations as a kid. Like I told you before, I went to four high schools, you know, constantly got uprooted, trying to find identity, et cetera. Um, but within all that, I was always curious. And so that kept me present. That curiosity about people kept me present. And I never, being kind, being curious, has never backfired on me. And I think that's what, that's why, and it's really humbling to hear that from from from, from someone like Ellis because he just doesn't, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't hand that shit out. And, you know, I, ad I admire someone like him because he's the bravest person I know. You know, this is a person who's chosen to live the entirety of their whole truth and, like, I, st I still got plenty of shit that, that is in the backpack for only me to see. And I watch how fucking tall this guy walks as a result of it. And I'm always just like, man, learn from this, you know? And so, yeah, I'm just wildly curious, man. I love everybody. I have something to learn from, from everybody for the most part, except for the people who wake up every day and think that they're better. And that they are, they should be afforded a certain whatever because of, you know, 
I don't know who they pray to or they're more fucking American than, than than the next person or, you know, any of that kind of shit. Like I don't, I don't have, I feel bad for those people actually because waking up, that's just fear. You know, people who refuse to engage or with people who are different than them and not just engage, not just tolerate, you know, I think the word tolerance is is the biggest fucking cop out on earth. Oh, well, I'm tolerant. Fuck your tolerance. You want an award? Because you're going to tolerate, you're going to put up with my existence because I'm different than you? Fuck tolerance. Acceptance. And go from acceptance and work towards being able to embrace. We are here for such a fucking short time that I marvel at. Like, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm mystified by people who wake up every day and put on their armor in the hopes of, like, letting people know that, like, you're not as good as me. You don't, you don't do this at the level that I do, and you shouldn't even exist because of the choices that you make. So I'm going to do everything I can to, like, Make sure you know it. What kind of, in, in, you know, in an existence where, like, yo, you're getting maybe 70s, maybe 80s, fucking 90s or 100s, you, they, they're putting you in the Hall of Fame if you make it to, like, the high. I am going to be here per, long, shorter than I've been here. I wake up every day with that knowledge. And I'm just, in the, especially in these times that we live in, the manner in which, like, people wake up hoping they're going to get to fucking throw a stone at somebody else. I just don't, I, I cannot comprehend it. And so, yeah, man, I just, I, 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 I make an effort every day to work towards, like, finding my blind spots and trying to shave off, um, whatever biases I have towards people who are different than me. I'm not perfect by any means at it. But I I find joy in trying to work at, like, chipping away my fear armor every day. And it usually leads to, like, interactions or exchanges or, or, or growth and opportunities that I never could have predicted all because of choosing to, to, to be open to someone else. And so many people have helped me. So many people have helped me. Um, many people tried to stand in my way, but I don't remember them. I remember the people who held open a door for me or left a crack in the window and been like, yo, this shit is unlocked. It's up to you to open it and climb in, but like I'm leaving it unlocked for you. Or people who have like actively blocked from me and like made a hole and be like, run motherfucker. Now the rest is on you. And so that's what I, it's what I try to do with what I have to give with the space that I've earned. I ain't perfect at it. I got my shit, but that's just, I enjoy being here when I'm in that energy. And I hope that when I'm no longer here, that that's what people remember me for. It's very, very, very humbling to get that from from you, Ellis, mate. And I love you too. Those are some beautiful words. Incredibly beautiful. And right now I feel like people are more at odds than ever in my life that I've seen. Yeah. This last five years, man, it's, it's heavy. It's heavier than it's ever seemed in my lifetime. Uh, yeah. I mean, we've witnessed. I don't know if it's social media showing it to us more or is it actually... I think it's social. I personally think it, it, that it is social media throwing a match at natural gasoline mm -hmm. that we have as humans. Because obviously, like we look through history, conflict is nothing new, but it's been amplified in a way that you can like play over and over again, and like <sighs> <sighs> right, you can get caught up in in the cycle in a way that is so much different. Like we spend time in these worlds where we're just like 
adding each other, 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 and not really, we're lucky, right, by, by the lifestyles that we choose, that we at least get like a hard break from it, where we're on edge and we're pushing ourselves in the mountains or, or whatever it is, but like for so many people, like that's become their refuge, that's become their place, become like um, the place where they feel seen, you know, and I think there's an opportunism in social media where, like, if I have an agenda that, like, isn't popular in the streets, I can go and find a bunch of people who think the same way as me and create mm. create a thing that makes me, gives me the ability to walk tall. Mm-hmm. Validation. Right? It gives me validation because maybe I don't have the skill set that I see everyone else have or I don't have the finished products or the lifestyle that I'm able to see people presented. Um, you know, we, we, we so don't look at the journey and we're so presented with like, it's just so results oriented that I understand where people can get bitter to the point of like, it's gotta be a conspiracy against me, Mm -hmm. especially if you just sit and live on fucking Facebook all day. Mm -hmm. And Facebook's asking, what, what's your opinion on this? What did you do today? What yell, yell into the void, what you're yell. Uh, as soon, what your opinion is. As soon as, and fuck anybody who gets pissed off by this, like, I'm not here to appease. I don't even make this as a political statement. As soon as Trump t- came down the escalator in 2015, when he made his announcement for president, I remember how it felt. I remember him sitting there and talking about, you know, Mexicans and this and that. And I rem- I was like, oh, there are a lot of people who have been having these conversations at their Thanksgiving table, but never talking this way in the streets. And suddenly, here's a person who's saying, hey, you know those things you think you can only say in private amongst a handful of people that think like you? Say that shit out in the streets. In fact, say that shit to those people. Let them know that they're less. And I remember the way, I remember how instantly, it was like someone flipped a switch on the toxicity in Facebook. Mm. And people started being like, yeah. And I just, I remember like three months into that election, I was like, you know what? I'm going to tap out. I'm going to shut this shit down. I just, there was an energy in it for me where I was like, none of this is real. And I saw people getting like, people who I thought I knew being like, I'm like, oh, <laughs> shit. that's who you've been this whole time. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tap out. And that was the best decision I think I ever gave myself. But to see what it's like for people who like, th- that's the place they go to vent. Yeah. It's uh, it's tough, and then you look at the last the last year and a half between COVID and civil rights. Shit. I mean, even Instagram, which was a place that <laughs> was kind of like, hey, we don't do that here. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Post pictures. Yeah. <laughs> show me that you're, you know, show show me the fake photographer that you are. Like the good times. That shit is 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 also over and has become hella toxic. I mean, I remember last year during George Floyd when I started really talking about, in the wake of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, et cetera, which was obviously taking place in this very interesting um, time and moment where there was no place for anyone to go and hide. You couldn't go and, like, be busy with shit because, like, we were all in the house. And so I think it was the first time that people had to look at, like, race in America and they couldn't run from the conversation. And what that brought up in spaces and places that for a very long time, I think, had gotten to be above it or think they were independent or it didn't apply, suddenly it's like, you know what? We're going to have that conversation here too. And people started feeling comfortable to share their experiences and why, like, hey, it's hard here and here's why and we need to address it 
you know, I, I still trip out that like the whole country watched that eight minutes and 40 seconds of video. And then within a week, people had figured out a way to justify that man's death. And to be like, hey, you don't get to uh, talk to me that way. I had someone say to me, this is a guy who, who used to shape my surfboards. He said to me, I just don't think that you people should make that your martyr because he wasn't a good person. He was on drugs. And um, while it's too bad that he died, he, he shouldn't be your martyr. I said to him, I said, do you know what a martyr is? A martyr is someone who volunteers their life for a cause. They actively calculate the risks and they say, you know what? I'm willing to die for this thing to help move this thing forward. I will sacrifice my life. That you could take a murder that we all watched and because it's so foreign to you, because this thing we've been talking about for years that people of color says takes place, we have a different interaction with the people we pay to protect and serve us. And now you've seen it in a way that you can't hide from. But your, your pull is to like, I got to find a reason to justify this because if I can't find a reason to justify this, then that means I have to look at mm. and I have to listen to what people are telling me is their experiences and also like this country that is on paper, quote unquote, the best country in the world is also indictable for problems that it continues to uphold and then I got to think about like how we work together to make that better or fuck that wrap myself in the flag this is absolute America's the best and all that shit you people are complaining and if you just did this and obeyed or be more like us, you wouldn't have these problems. And it was so interesting how in like, it was, it took like five days before people were like, yeah, I'm going to go back to wrapping myself, just cloaking in the flag. Because if I have to like, if I have to listen to you tell me that if I have to accept that we have a race problem in America and that it's always existed and I've been una wonderfully unaware of it, that I've had the privilege to be wonderfully unaware of it because I haven't experienced it and I don't know people that have that experience. Yeah, that's too much for me. So I'm just going to be obstinate and I'm going to dig down and um, tell you that what you're, what you're living isn't even a real thing. I get DMS all the time from people in our own community in the shred world to be like, you're clearly such a fucking grifter, bro. Like, white people put you in the position where you are. We made you. We let you into our thing. And then you turn on us by standing up for all this black, black Lives Matter shit. Shh. Fuck you. Without us, like, we made you. Well, thank you for proving my point. And it's been hard because I, I think I, for a long time, I... I, I gave our communities way too much credit. I just thought we were, yes, they were assholes. I went through all sorts of racism coming up, but I thought like the core of our collective was rooted in like, nah, we're, we, are, we are the definition of being open. And I found out in the last year that that's just not the case. And we got a lot of work to do. Yes, our thing is great. It's the most amazing experience, et cetera. But people go back to their lives. And they bring their shit that they live to the thing. And we, got, we, we have work to do to, to open up and, and, and make it more accessible and diversify the playing field. And I think when people can understand how much more beautiful it makes the thing when everyone has access to it, no one's taking anything away from you. It's so crazy to me the way I hear people describe, like, oh, I just don't like, you know, you guys want handouts. <laughs> Do you ever wonder, I would say to people, why I'm the only person who looks like me at the X Games? 
did 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 you, you ever wonder why like there's only been like two people that look like me that competed? Do you think that we're we're not into having a good time and and wouldn't like to benefit in like playing in the outdoors, etc.? No. We didn't have access to this shit, and that shit was by design. I'm sorry if that freaks your brain out. It's not an indictment of you. Like when people hear you say systemic racism or white supremacy, I've had people be like, ah! Hey, I didn't say you, white person. I said this system that was set up, that it's built on, that we function. We still function in these antiquated laws that are rooted in this thing. Let's join together and, like, smash it so we can all move forward. But if if it triggers you to the point where, like, I don't want to learn history. I don't want to know about any of what your experiences are. I hear white, so you're talking about me. Get the fuck out of here. I, I got no time and no patience. And that's where the, like, <laughs> that's where the love ends because I don't have the energy to to deal with that level of ignorance in 2021. And I hope... I, I do have faith that we will be able to move forward as a uh, as a collective, and people will will, will want to open their eyes and let go of trying to live in the past. But man, it's so crazy to be like in the most advanced time that we have technologically, and also like literally like trying to drop the car in reverse while we're going 120 miles down the freeway, and thinking that the transmission's not just going to drop out. Anyway, I'm off my soapbox. That was great. No, there's so much valuable things that were said there. And, and also, like, you know, this, you're on a, we're on a snowboard podcast. Buds and I are two white dudes. And it's like, we'll never know. We'll never know your experiences until you talk about them. Like, w- we just won't. And so um, there's so many things there. When I'm listening, like, what I'm hearing, too, and I'm, like, evaluating it, too, I just... Like there's so much lack of open mindedness, and, and when I when I dissect that a little bit, and societally what we're doing too is like, you know, people they pick a side, right, and and they say, and, and that's essentially they're they're building a court case, exhibit A, B, C of why I'm correct about this thing, right, and, and what I see is when when someone says, well, hey, look at it from this perspective, well, that that does not coincide with my court case, so what does that do? That that flares my ego. My, my open, I have no open mindedness because my ego is so fucking big. I need to be correct. So what you're saying is that like, we have a problem in the pro- in this country. Well, that means I got to take a look in the mirror and I, it's so much easier to point the finger mm. than it is to take a look in the mirror, right? It's yeah. where it's like, it's much easier because, because if, if I, t- if I have to take a look in the mirror, that means I have to make a change. I don't want to make a change. Yeah. Fuck no, that. Right. So I, I don't know. I, I don't really know where I'm going with this, but just kind of like spitballing them for no, you. Said. It's an open, open <laughs> forum. When the light needs to be shined on it, because it's it's disgusting, really, to hear that people that you've known all of a sudden you've seen a different side of them. Like that sucks. Yeah, it's been crazy, man. I mean, I've gotten a, a, a ton of love and people who have told me they've decided to read and learn and now want to participate in like helping to like make our culture more um, just expand the landscape. Provide access. One thing that we do really well in, in in the ski and snowboarding industry is like reach out to people who live far away from mountains and get them hyped to come and have this experience. And so when I talk to brands, etc., I'm just like, just do what you've always been doing. You 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 pinpoint people and you build relationships with them all year that are, make it aspirational for them to get to the top, get to elevation, go. <sighs> yes. All you have to do is do that to people who traditionally have had a barrier to them, do that same thing. Yeah, break down that barrier. Break out break down that barrier and help help build a road. It, it's you don't have to do anything other than you know how to do. And I think once people get to that point and realize like, oh, that 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 that's all like, yeah, you ain't gotta be in the streets fucking protesting. I'd much rather you like use the actual tools, the things that you're good at that you have access to to just provide a little bit of window and we'd be surprised what we're capable of as a collective. But I think your, your point is so strong. Like people are afraid to pivot and to realize like, Oh, the world's changing. I got to change with it. I got to grow with it. 
And I think that's what scares people. It's like, I want it to be like the past was. Like, well, what was so great about that? I'm way more into the potential for, like, how much better we can get at being towards each other. Clearly, like, we have some shit as animals. Like, we might have free will, but there's there are some snap points where we just run and, like, tribe up or whatever. But there's no there's no, like, love stories that come out of, like, people attacking each other. Mm-hmm. There's no winners. That's to, there's no fucking it's just winners. two people going like this. Nah. Yeah. Now I have a question for you and I want I would love to be I would love to hear like a counter or any any type of perspective on this but for me there was a lo- there was a period where I was getting really really angry about the things I was seeing on the internet people that kind of were uh, very deep opposing kind of views towards things I was it, you know, I thought was, there's some disgusting things that disgusted me on the internet, right? And my my way of finding peace with it was that I kind of realized that, like, if I grew up in their circumstances and experienced life exactly like they did with the influence of their parents and the experiences they went through and the environment they grew up in, if you grew up in a hick town with five people and you fucking were next to the fertilizer your whole life, like... You you might have like a different perspective because everybody else in your town has that same perspective, and you you're influenced heavily by your friends. So I kind of came to a piece that like with some people with some of these fucked up views, like for better or worse, I might think that same way if I grew up there. Now now I wanted to hear like you if you have a take on that or if, what, if I'm wrong. I, what, I don't know, just a, a thought about that. You know, like not to say that doesn't need to change, but it was a way to like find empathy maybe. No, I, I I I concur. I think my ability to like have patience for well, that's just how that person grew up. When you're an adult and you're aware, but you still choose to make that choice, that's kind of where my patience mm. runs thin. And I just I can't. I, I had a friend tell me that like I should have this person who screamed at me at. At uh, at a surf break, and called me a racist in front of a bunch of other surfers because they were mad about what I've been talking about the last year, and so they told me that I should get off of my bike, my uh, my e bike, and like fight them. Very well known person in in the surfing industry. You should call him and ask him to be on your podcast, and you guys could. Br- what? You want me to call the person who like accosted and assaulted me uh, and ask him if, he, if if we can have the conversation? No. I just don't, I'm not going to deal with him. If that person decides that they want to make some changes, he showed me his cards. The man literally said, get off of your bike so I can beat your ass. You're the racist, not us. I didn't say anything to him. I just was riding by. But him seeing me, made him well up in such mm. a way that that was the response. I, I, I got, and then the, and the, the friend said to me, well, you know, he grew up in, not my problem. He's a 50 year old man with kids and a highly successful business. I don't, that's not my job or it's my, you know, it's not my area. If you, if you're ready to like want to have conversation and engage, I would sit down with that person tomorrow. If he was like, Hey, I was wrong. I want to know about what your life's like. Yeah, let's go. Now we're going to get into it. But like I, I, that's not I've we as 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 black people in this country, as indigenous people in this country and as people of color in this country, the amount of like micro shit you got to deal with every day with people um wanting to point out your shit or like you know, filling out a job application and worrying that your name, not last name not being Smith or Johnson and your first name John or Pete is going to greatly diminish your chance of even getting the interview. That's just real shit. And if you've never experienced it, people would be like, what? That's crazy. But it's the truth. It's like, Statist, the data is there for miles. That's just what it is. <laughs> yeah, Ethan Fortier and Chris Grenier, not the same as Salama. 
Salema Mabena Massacat. Like, yeah. People are like, oh, they is don't your even fa- need to see your picture. Is They're your gonna- family French? Yeah. <laughs> They're going to make a decision. We went to the Sorbonne. <laughs> 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 They're not even gonna see your photo. They don't need to see your photo. They've already made the decision based on your name. And that's like a, that's a that's a that's just like one of the the small things yeah. that we deal with. You know, when I first started snowboarding, um, and for years, I just remember like what it felt like to stand in the lift line and to feel the stairs, and the stairs were not like, "Hey, bro," it was just like, oh. and then people being like. What are you doing here? Like not happy you're there. Yeah. I didn't even know Surprised. you guys. I didn't even know you guys do th- did this. Hi, that's so cool that there's a, you're a black guy here. Like wild shit. And just becomes commonplace mm-hmm. to the point where like when I see a black person in the lift line who I've never met before and we lock eyes, it's like, oh, you single? I'm a single, and we're going to take a chair lift up together, and we are going to tell each other the exact same stories about the shit that takes place, but how much we love this thing, that those experiences don't matter to us. Mm-hmm. They suck, but they ain't going to take the joy from us. We love this shit too much. I can't tell you how many times that that's happened in snowboarding. And, again, if it's never, if you've never experienced it, of course, it sounds crazy. That sounds exactly. crazy. Yeah, if that's not that's end? people have listened to well that's not what my experience is like. Yeah. And that's Don't the thing. That to me. That's well that's not my experience. Like that's the that's, that's the issue. not that's not my experience. So it didn't happen and you're looking for attention or people to feel sorry for you. And I'm like, yo, if you think that we wake up if you think that any people that have dealt with oppression wake up going I hope that today's the day that I get to, like, talk about the shit or have to fight about some, sh- some shit. Like, people just want to, like, live their short-ass mm-hmm. lives and try to, like, navigate all the other problems that we have going on. Nobody that, wants that negative attention like that. No, it ain't fun. Every time that I, like, speak out, it's always like, oh, man. But I, it's when I don't have a choice that I'm like, okay, I'm willing to risk it all mm-hmm. if maybe it can help with some conversation Mm -hmm. is all it's going to come with flared egos. It's going to come with flared, you know, people that, that doesn't, doesn't match that. But one thing I kind of noticed, I wanted to highlight too, when, as you're talking, right, listening to yourself and, and your journey and how you've been able to become obviously massively successful and you didn't have any super deep education. You know, it's not like you went to fucking Harvard or whatever, or like entertainment school, like, you know, when, when I was, when I was listening to you talk, it sounds like, you know, relationships, your relationships with human beings has gotten you to these extreme heights in your career. And, and also your ability in what I was listening to be interested, I get, believe curious was the word you used in what people are saying. Like you sound like you're interest, like you're genuinely interested and curious as to what people are saying to you. And, and you're able to build these relationships and you actually, and what does that mean? Somebody cares and somebody's listening to you. They fucking care. And it's, uh, it's kind of funny, this ironic paradigm that like, then, but then when you say something, people have a hard time listening to you and actually putting themselves in your shoes. Yeah. It's, it, it is, it is strange because that is, that has been the nature of, of it for me. And it is all, and that's the whole nature of our thing. I haven't seen stone in shit. Might be twenty years. I don't know. <laughs> May, maybe, yeah. maybe like shortly after you 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 left Transworld. But I got all those memories of our times together, being like we're in the th- and this motherfucker like kicking shit around. To be like this thing's in Oceanside, California. This is snowboarding we're talking about, and y'all being comfortable here isn't going to like dictate what the magazine looks and feels like. I remember the manner in which you would put your foot down and stand up for the actual people who like live and breathe it, who are there. Like it might, the final product might come from here, but if it ain't repping that shit, this ain't the magazine to work at. Like this is not the Bible of the sport unless we're going to be that. And this dude, like he kicks shit around, but he kicks shit, he kicks shit around from like, it was, it was, I remember like seeing your passion and knowing like, ah, oh, that's so cool. 
and like listening to you talk about where you came from. And I'd be like, all right, cool. I get that. Clearly, like just riding Summit and Big Bear ain't it. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> you know? Um, and then that, but having that relationship, that connection, and then seeing you guys, you know, do bomb hodge. Remember, the first, I just was like, "Yes, that's it's my guy, yeah, <laughs> my dope. fucking guy." Mm-hmm. And he was always the shit, and always so passionate, and like stood up for riders, and was he, he was riders first, mm-hmm. you know, and making it about what it was about. And I learned from that, you know, and like that's that's what I think is that's what's so great about the era that we came up in 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 snowboarding. Yeah, it's definitely changed a lot, huh? It was all about relationships and being all for one for the thing. And if you mm-hmm. violated the thing, can't really fuck with you. All right, we're going to take a break to talk to you guys about the bomb hole of the week. What's going on, buds? First, let's talk about that sick Volcom team. Who's on the team these days? Uh, off the top of my head, first guys that come to mind on the younger side, we got Reed Smith, Parker Zumowski, uh, Benny Milam. Benny Milam might not benefit from this as much as those other riders you mentioned, but Volcom has a new cool thing called the ZipTech interface. Basically, you can take a jacket and pant, turn it into a one-piece by zipping it together at the powder skirt. And uh, it's going to keep winter elements out, keeping guys like Reed Smith who roll around in the snow a lot dry and stay out in snow longer. So what, what you're saying is Benny Milam doesn't really fall, yeah, he doesn't so fall. he doesn't need it, but Reed Smith and Parker Zumowski are out there just bomb-holing, landing on their back, so they're going to need it. I mean, I'm sure if I was Benny, I would use it just to make the rest of the team feel good and, and be a part of the team. Okay, like but a participation award participation type of situation. Award. So what he, we, he doesn't need it as much as the other guys. What kind of giveaways we got going on? So we got an awesome giveaway. What we want you to do is queue up your best bails on Instagram, hashtag Volcom Bomb Proof. And uh, what's going to happen? You'll get a little prize pack from the guys over at Volcom and the guys here at the bomb hole, us. And I think uh, one of your favorite pros on the team will be picking. Yeah, that's the best part about it. So These guys pick the bail. Upload it onto IG. Go out there and make sure you savagely bail. You're going to want to do it. You can do it purposely if you want to win that bad. If you want to stay dry out there, get the patented zip tech on your gear from Volcom. Let's do this. We have another guest question uh, from... A gentleman that appears to be near and dear to your heart, Mr. Jeff Pensiero. Here we go. Hello, Bombhole. Hello, Salema. You're doing great, both of you. Uh, just thought I'd ask a quick question of my friend Salema. If you had one activity that you could do one time in your life before the end, before the big, you know, kabang, would you choose a powder day with your friends, an ultimate powder day, or an ultimate surfing day? Can't wait to hear the answer. <laughs> think, think about what podcast you're on before you answer that. Too. True. This is such a uh, Jeff question because he'll call me up some days just to give me shit for being a surfer. Really? I can't believe that you put up with that shit. <laughs> Snowboarding's way cooler. I love you. That's him. Um, honestly, I'm going to say this. A powder day with your friends in the backcountry is, there's nothing else like it. Now listen, getting barreled in the middle of Indonesia or Tahiti is awesome. But if I had a choice for like a full day, it, I would choose... A powder day with my best friend. That's the correct answer. That Good is job. the right answer. Nice. I don't know. Surfing seems to keep people young, though, huh? Now, yeah. I, I do it on a regular basis. I surf more than I snowboard because I live at the coast. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. If I was like, so wait, I got a day left? Well, yeah, take me to wherever the fucking snow is deep and light, and I can bring my best friends, and we're going to go up and down all day. Let's go. True. We're starting at sunrise. We're flying out at dark. <laughs> we're landing at the top, we're watching the sunrise, and we're getting like 15,000 feet that day. And for the record, sidebar, Jeff Pensiero owns uh, Bald Face Lodge, one of the greatest places on earth. If you guys ever have a chance to check it out, it's fucking awesome. It, so. I'm going um, for the first time since the Coviticus uh, for New Year's, and I'm very excited. Well, I've heard New Year's up there is the jam. I've been in New Year's the last six years. Six years. Woof. It's pretty pretty epic. 
Anyway. Sounds unreal. Jeff yeah. just got just got a free plug. So you guys, I think, got seats in a cat out of yeah. this. Yeah, that would be dope. For oh, yeah. sure. I've never been. Yeah, I, I have to actually say, I've this. been a lot of places, but I've never been there. Do you want to go? I would love to go. Like, we, do you really want to go? I really want to go. Yeah. Like, would you be down to go New Year's? Uh, I don't know <laughs> if I could afford it. Is the problem? We'll talk after the show. All right. All right. Also, I got I got a seat. If you want to go, I would go. I got a seat in my cat. Really? Yeah. Dead ass. All right, I'm going to figure it out. Figure this out. And I got to say something about Jeff Pensiero real quickly. Uh, You said something about a plug or whatever, but Jeff listens to the show. I talk to him, text him. He's a great human being. He sent us $1,000 and said, guys, I just like what you're doing. I don't care what you do with it. Just you guys rule. And uh, no strings. It's just that that is just like a speech to somebody's character. And he never would probably want me to bring this up. And he's probably pissed off that I'm bringing this up. But he's just one of those dudes that's just a fucking incredible human being. Remember what we were talking about before about that Mount Rushmore? Mm-hmm. Jeff, that's another face. As far as stewards of the culture, it would be a big mountain. It wouldn't be like, you know, just four people. So, so far we got KB, we got Pensy Hero, where the yeah. sculptor is going to have to... <laughs> Right, we got to get this sculpture. The, there's up. only two people who have sent us money like that. It's Blotto <laughs> and Pensiera. Yeah, no Blotto's way. Yeah. Too, yeah. Well, just Blotto's love what we're doing. Like, no strings attached. Just here's some money. Maybe it's just a mountain range. Yeah, uh, a range, full yeah. range. Because <laughs> Blotto would definitely. Yeah, Blotto. <laughs> Blotto might have to be on there, too. For sure. Mm-hmm. Okay, we have another guest question from your producer for a long time named Claude Merkel from the uh, Red Bull Signature Series. Here we go. Hello, Bombhole and Salema. Thanks for sharing your stories today. You certainly have enjoyed the journey. So let me, you're such a natural storyteller. I wonder if you'd ever consider sharing some stories from behind the scenes, like before or after an event, maybe under a pseudonym. (laughs) I know some are really funny, some are sad, some are uncomfortable and even ugly. And there have been more than a few that, shall we say, are a tad risque. How about it? Claude's amazing. I've worked with Claude for almost a decade. Before or after? Here's a good one. Uh, the first, first, um, what was it? it we, su- supernatural. When it was Supernatural, the first one that I got to do. I had just left ESPN. And we were starting a Red Bull Signature Series. And I had to go to Europe to do something before then. And I got, like, crazy strep throat. You ever get strep throat? Harsh. Harsh. It weighs you out. You know, you get the tickle. And you're like, ah, no, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to beat this. And then once it gets to hurt to swallow, you're going for a ride. And we're, we're working and we're, we're shooting. Um, we're at this like ice thing in Europe. And then I got to double back to get to straight, straight to, um, to uh, Spokane and then drive to Baldface for the first time. And by the time we get back to, um, to America, I haven't eaten in like two days. And I'm, I'm starting to like get faint. Like it's, it's not good. But we got bald face in two days. So I said to the guy, I'm like, to the producer I was with, going up to meet Claude, first, also first time ever at bald face. Like, I can't believe I'm getting to go to this thing. And you got strep throat? You fucking amateur. Like, what is happening? And I go into this Spokane General Hospital. They open my mouth, and the guy just, I just remember him being like, <laughs> damn. <laughs> Apparently, like, the back of my throat was a war zone, just red and polyps and the whole thing. And he's like, you're past the point of any oral um, antibiotics or medicine. We literally need to give you injections. So I got, like, had to, I had to get, like, injections um, of these antibiotics that, like, knocked me out for, like, 24 hours. And then um, the next day, I was decent enough to travel. And then by the time I got to bald face, like, I was super weak. I'd lost, like, 10 or 11 pounds in the course of the last week and a half of just working through the thing. And I finally got to the point where I could work, did the event. And then afterwards, Jeff was like, hey, 
you didn't get to ride, you should stay. And I didn't know Jeff. And um, I got to stay, and I rode with Trav, Hawken, Gigi, Mueller, like all, it was the greatest day ever. And I just Supernatural, the original one? Yeah, this is the original Supernatural. And I just remember sitting in the cat that day and being like, this is the greatest day of snowboarding I've ever had. There's a GoPro operator kid. There were these two <laughs> twins. I heard about this. These two twins. And um, they're kind of like, you know, influencer type bros early on. GoPro hotshot skier kids. And the one kid was kind of a nuisance. Like he really wanted to prove that he was down, even though he was skiing. No offense, skiers that listen to the podcast, this isn't a slight. But in this particular case, he was one of those skiers. <laughs> Just wanted to prove that he was as cool and could do shit. You're riding with the greatest snowboarders on earth and me. And we're heading down, I think it was Pachinko or something, this, this beautiful just like land of pillows and poppers, having a field day. I send it on this one. I'm in midair like, this is the best day of my life. Bam! I get tackled in midair. Like, it felt like a, like a, I got hit by a missile. This fucking kook from this GoPro kid decides to cross court blindly to, and do some yee thing, takes me out, and I get his ski across my tibia plateau, cuts my pants open. And also knocks me out. Come to, da 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 da, like, what the hell happened? Oh, so sorry, bro. Like, I just didn't, like, what? What? Ah. And um, anyway, after that whole thing to get there, this thing happens. If you know anything about the tibia plateau, if you bruise it, it's just one of those things that takes, like, months to go away. They, they couldn't do anything surgically because it didn't, I didn't sever it. But, um... The tibia plateau and the patella were just to the touch. And when you, every time you take a step, like your kneecap flexes, and you, that's this thing you take for granted for, is, is suddenly like someone is jamming blades into your, your leg. And anyway, I didn't ride again the rest of the season. So, um, yeah. And I had to go, we went back to Europe to go to Austria to do something. I couldn't ride, and it was snowing like crazy. And I was limping for two months, and that was my season. Yeah, that was uh, Jeff mentioned that that story that to story. me. He <laughs> kind of said that that might be the only person in the history of of the world Salema has uh, maybe a slight grudge against. So. <laughs> yeah, the skier that hit him. I <laughs> do. I still. I still. I, I hold a. <laughs> hold I grudge. hold a huge <laughs> ass grudge <laughs> against that kid. So I was speaking with uh, T Bird earlier, yesterday. Let's give him a little air horn. Potential Mount Rushmore. Absolutely. Yeah, I would pop him on that. Absolutely. We're gonna have to definitely talk to our. Uh, <laughs> Or uh, sculptors, sculptors, yeah, sculptors, sculptors yeah. see, what, see what he does. But Monterosso, definitely, yeah. definitely, definitely. And you guys have shared some incredible times in the booth. But before we get into that, he he was bringing up a great point about progression, and we were talking about how how progression, you know, within with tricks and stuff. It, I don't want to say it's plateaued, but it's like you know, one more cork, bigger rail, all that, right? And it, it's it's just been it's been insane. And he was kind of mentioning the fact that like, I think the new progression is the ethos in which we look at snowboarding, like, um, you know, it should be more about instead of saying, how do we do one more cork? It's like, how do we get more people involved? Bang. Like, how do we, how do we get more people involved? And, um, I, in your opinion, what do you like? How do we get more people involved to the sport? We love so much. I know you're part of stoked, uh, dot org and all these things, but I don't want to interrupt you, but no. yeah, go ahead with that. First of all, I mean that's a the, there's many prongs to that, right? The gymnastics, the gymnastic, I don't, it's not a word, but the gymnastic, gymnastic, gymnastization. <laughs> <laughs> I just made it up again. <laughs> I didn't go to college. Um, Disclaimer: gymnastic, gymnastification. Yes, there it is. That's, that's the word. It. Gymnastification of uh, competitive snowboarding. Breaks my heart. Really breaks my heart. Um, I feel sorry for the athletes that have to do these tricks that they never do in real life. But 
I have to have to. I got to throw another fucking one eighty in there, otherwise I'm not even pro anymore. Um, when I watch someone like Rene 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 Congas, when I watch him ride, I'm just like, fuck yeah, this is this is it. Like I don't know what's gonna happen, and I don't know if he does either. And it's that's snowboarding to me. It's the the improvisation. Snowboarding to me is improv. And like jazz. I like that. Sorry like, to interrupt you. Yes. Like your dad playing jazz. Like yeah. goddamn jazz. Absolutely. Yep. That's not an interruption. That's an addition. Um, it's jazz. And I want to see I, I want to I want to see the com- competitive end of it jazzier. I think the bigger the stage is, the more it's become a, a lot more like ski disciplines and and style is sort of like a is a side piece. And to me, it's like, if you can't do, like, a double cork, like, s- styled out, wh- what are you doing spinning threes and fours for? It's not attractive, and I feel sorry for you. I can't do these things, but I'm just speaking about it from the perspective of snowboarding. Mm-hmm. So to the point of what Tom was talking about, yes, how about progression also including the expansion of the playing field? Um, and the landscape and what it looks like and providing more more access to people's souls because we all still do the thing because how it how it makes you feel and that you can carry that feeling into your actual life right all of the things the falling down and getting back up the having to fucking negotiate some fucked up to ter- terrain that like Fun suddenly being like, oh shit, life's on the line here. Those are things that you're able to take and apply to your life, how you live, your work, your relationships, all those things. I believe that they transfer. That's what we do at stoke.org. You know, we started it 15 years ago. We take kids that normally would not have access to the mountains or to skating or to surfing. And and when it's a place like that, that A, no one's ever told you is for you, you're, it's extremely intimidating, and you got to overcome that as a kid. It's not like a, an option luxury of like, oh, what can I do to like entertain myself? But this is something much different in the way that you get it. You know, learning how to make peace with and befriend the mountain, that changes your life. You know, learning how to fucking fall down and get back up, that changes your life when you go back to that place to your neighborhood and to your social socioeconomic spaces that are far different than the place you just were but you you're living in the in the in in the frequency and the energy of that thing that's going to affect the way you make decisions in your life how you treat your how you treat others how you treat yourself you're a lot kinder to yourself when you learn how to fall down and get back up um, and you can find these incredibly simple joy in like the sliding down a mountain. And I think that um, for snowboarding and the total of outdoors, when you know these are spaces that like the reason why for the most part like a certain type of people live in the area isn't because like those people are more like into it. It's just especially in America, it was like they kind of cut off access and made the outdoors a place that was a safe space, especially in the 50s and 60s on the back end of segregation, the outdoors, the ocean, those were, were like the last bastions of safe spaces for white people when segregation was no longer legal. And things like redlining and no matter how much money you have, like the bank's not giving you a loan to be able to live in these spaces. They became like quite un- unspoken, but spoken um, places of, of safe havens. And that's how you know the, the outdoor movement came to look just a certain way. So I think to that point, like, and we're starting to see the progress of it, expanding and creating access just means more, more, more diversity in what it looks like and what people are bringing to the table. And this thing being such like a great way to personally express yourself, you see different forms of personal expression, right? So, yeah, I think as much as like, that's a beautiful point that Tom makes, like, Progression of tricks, that's for a handful of people on the planet. 
And we've lived so much in like the putting the pressure on a handful of people to dictate the tone and the entire definition of what the sport is. Mm -hmm. And this thing is a lifestyle. Mm -hmm. It's a lifestyle first. And the, the, the sports part of it is, and the competition part of it is cool. But the lifestyle should, should be the total lifestyle and the culture should define the thing mm -hmm. and not the other way around. That's so I agree wholly with Tom and I think we're starting to see it. And there's some, there's an, there's another layer to this too, that we're talking about too, because looking at the, the whole thing from a, from a bigger picture, not from the ground, not from the ground level, but looking at the playing field from 3000 feet, when you look at snowboarding, okay, the, in, the end, the whole fucking thing is, when there's more people doing it and more people into it, it's good for everybody. It's good for the brands. It's, it's good for the companies you want to work for. Or if you're a pro rider, there's more money. There's potentially maybe it gets more TV time and the X Games and things like that. And I know that you recently uh, pivoted. In, you have an incredible kind of backstory into your role over at Burton, which kind of ties into this conversation. What do you mean? Like... Well, all right, I guess. All right, so this is what I was going to say. We, we kind of were talking during the Patreon interview. And, oh, and, right, and right, And basically right. kind of, you know, Burton is is the biggest snowboard company, right? That you can pretty much put a period on that, right? Yeah. You can put a period at the end of that sentence. And with Burton, they, uh, you know, if, if they're doing well, the snowboard industry is doing well. And if they're sick, the industry's sick. Like, if mama's sick, everybody's sick. That mm. kind of mentality, right? Mm. And, um, you know, I, I don't really know how I'm tying these two together, but what I'm trying to get at is basically, you know, we're, we're talking about, like, things that are good for the culture in general. Yeah. So you, you have bringing more people in, these, you know, b these bigger uh, agendas than just uh, support my video part or whatever the intricacies of, of, of industry snowboarding is. I want you to talk about your your role as uh, on the board of directors over at Burton. It's such a weird sentence to hear. <laughs> you know, your role as on the board of directors. like what? Um, yeah, being on uh, on the executive board is is the highest, like, coolest honor that I've ever gotten from in snowboarding, um, and and to have it be in the wake of Jake who was very much a mentor to me and um you know to be seen by someone like jake burton as you're on the come up that's like a to be seen and like seen like acknowledge i see what you have to give come work at my things be a part of our things that's a level of validation that like fills you with jet fuel you know and he was always that way and i'm very 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 grateful for it i don't think that i would have continued um to try to like climb at certain points if it wasn't for that you know and, and then to lose him obviously was devastating to the entirety of the sport and then to get asked to be on the board by his by his son and and by his wife was crazy you know and then and then being like we believe this is something jake would have wanted like just tears I literally, I wept. I called my, the, I called my mom. I called my mom. I never forget. I was crying. She's like, "Why are you crying?" I was like, "You just asked me to sit on the board at Burton. Like, what's going on?" She was like, "Yes, baby. Like, yeah, of course." I was like, "No, of course." <laughs> but um, you know, you get past all the emotion. And like, oh, sh now you're you're in the mix. They're a business. They got to make power moves. It's com it's competitive. But as you touched on. And what I try to bring to the conversation, not being like some Fortune 500 businessman that sits on the board, but someone who, it's my my ability to be as connected to the culture as I am helps me to be able to communicate that to the board. And I think that as Burton goes, snowboarding goes. The brands don't compete to kill each other. They compete to move snowboarding forward. That's my that's how I've always looked at it. There's going to be some people yelling at the TV for like, when they hear that. I bet. Yeah. <laughs> some brands but will I kill like other it. brands. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, like, it's highly competitive. But, like, I don't think anyone's trying to put anybody out of business. They're trying to say we dominated, we sold more boards, our product's better, our team's better, all that shit. Yeah. Everybody who would walk in here would tell you why they're the best and everyone else sucks. 
That's always been part. But that's like that's the that's the chest puffing part. Yeah, competition's healthy. Yeah, competition is hella healthy. However, every one of those brands, I believe, would admit that like without burden, what do we got? Mm-hmm. Like, what do we got? This brand has the largest amount of market share and the biggest footprint. It is a legacy brand, and it is the most identifiable symbol of snowboarding to the rest of the world outside of snowboarding. So therefore, I say, as Burton goes, snowboarding goes. The health of of the company, the manner in which Burton's doing business, the manner in which Burton is supporting the culture, expanding the landscape, landscape and growing snowboarding, because they have that reach, I believe directly to benefits every other brand in 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 the landscape. And they may not they might not admit it in the microphone, but they do amongst themselves for sure. And I think that that's one of the things that makes it unique and special. It's the reason why everyone from every brand, whether they they had fiery business relationships with with Jake or not, like they mourned him. Because he, you might not have loved the way he did it, but he fought for snowboarding in fighting to make Burton what it was and made a bunch of, sh- bunch of mistakes along the way, but stayed in the fight to the very end for snowboarding. It's been cool for me to like start to get the lay of the land. It's been less than a year. But to be on these, uh, you know, to, to be a part of these discussions and, and getting on, being in the midst of all the numbers, et cetera. And then when they come to me and be like, what's your perspective? And to be able to give that from the culture, to be able to have conversations with, with people who, whose feet are in the ground. And like, my, my favorite part is asking people questions like, what are we missing? What's, what's going on? Where, where are we at? Having come up, I think, the way we did in the 90s, there was something special about the way snowboarding just was cool by itself. And everybody else wanted to be down with it. And I hope that we, that's something I think snowboarding needs to get back to, is being being that driving force for pop culture as a whole. Um, and, and everybody else wanting to fuck with it. And that I think that's more about building culture that's attractive, that other people want to emulate, like that other things, want other places want to emulate, as opposed to just like, have you seen the biggest trick ever that is here today, gone today? Mm-hmm. Um, not taking anything away from it, but like th- that that energy, that culture, that's what's always made snowboarding attractive um, to everybody else. And so that's the part that I hope and I'm trying to bring to the table uh, as I learn even what it means um, to sit on this board. I have, a, I have a question, sidebar on that. As I'm listening to you talk, I think about... The early days when we first started talking about when you were announcing and, and you're painting a picture of the landscape of events. And in these events, it was all these snowboarders and they were just present in the moment and they were just getting some. And if you were there, you were in it, you were getting it. But there was no roadmap. There was no, if I do well at this contest, there's an Oakley deal where I can retire. Or if I do well at this. And and I'm curious, in your opinion, now that there is a roadmap where you know, little Timmy's dad can say, well, oh man, if you start chucking into the airbag at age six and you can do double corks by seven, then hell, oh, goddamn, by the age 10, you know, we might be able to get you in X games. And like, and so it's taken, a, you know, I mean, I'm kind of answering my own question in some ways, but, you know, do you think that the fact that there is a roadmap now has taken away from that just like counterculture. It's like people are doing it for a fucking career, right? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. Opinion. It's never going to go back to the way it was. Yeah. But that element can always be there. And there's always going to be the people's champs as a result, right? There's always going to be like those riders who they make a living from it, but they, the snowboarding is more important than the path, the roadmap. Mm. And so they leave bags on the table, right? Re- in order so that, like, wait, is that going to take away from me snowboarding? And we know, you know, you have those 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 people and those pros who are like, no, I'm good over here. Mm-hmm. I, I live the thing. I got some great deals, but I don't need to go do I, that, that, and that because it takes away from my path in in in, in how I live the 
how I live the thing. Mm -hmm. And there's that balance. Um, but I couldn't imagine the allure of knowing like, shit, if I win an Olympic gold medal, like I'm, I'm going to be at fashion week in Paris, <laughs> possibly. Right. Like I, I couldn't imagine the, the, the knowledge that like this path could throw me into the, the zeitgeist of like the rest of what the planet is and outside of snowboarding. And it's a slippery slope. Slippery slope comes with a shit ton. And there are too many names, too, too many, too many names of, of, of people who try, who tried it. And, um, that path has, has, has bit them and bit them hard. And then they just like, where'd that person go? Mm -hmm. What do you yeah, mean they don't? If you don't make it, you're out. Yeah. That chewed up and spit out. So how many people knew have like been chewed up and spit out and also I don't snowboard anymore? Yeah. yeah. It, then inversely, you take somebody who's had massive success, right? I, as you're talking, it almost made me think of like Danny Davis, for example. Danny, he's like on a powder trip right before X Games, goes to X Games, does great, goes back to Dryden Powder. And you take somebody like that and the difference is you, whether they're winning the X Games or they're not, they are, they're going to be, actually, uh, fuck it, let me it's reframe it like this. Thing. Whether they're making a, a shitload of money or not, you take away the contracts, he's still doing the same thing. He is such an anomaly in the thing. Like, his ability to, like, power up into that space, and then as soon as that's over, eye level. Side hits, let's go. Right? Like, oh, this little thing we're going to go build in the backyard, wh whatever. Like he, he has the this ability to like, literally like make himself huge, and then as soon as it's over, that he knows it's not sustainable for him, and he just mm -hmm. he comes down and compresses into like so eye level that you unless you know him, you don't know that Danny Davis is not only a pro snowboarder but like a, a, a icon. There's nothing about the way that dude walks that says like. Superstar, but he's a goddamn superstar. Like he, you, he wears he wears uh, open toed sandals with socks. Yeah, I have a does. photo on my phone <laughs> of the the like uh, the, you know the little toe. Yeah, he's got the toe, the, 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 the sock. Toe like whatever. he's wearing that after you little know camel toe. He's very much about the journey, and there's there's so many people like that. But I actually I shouldn't say that. There's there's not many people who occupy who are up in that rarefied air who can so quickly and seamlessly be back down to earth that's not he, he it, it's so it's just really really cool to witness absolutely hey uh buds i know we have a good patreon that you've been oh, hanging geez. on to been neglecting patreon he's so yeah. mesmerizing yeah <laughs> Jeez, i know it's i feel like i'm like in a book Me on tape yeah, and dude. i'm just glued. mesmerizing or exhausting i don't know the one from jake winbush yeah all right First of all, thank you to all the Patreon members. Uh, we could not do this without you. We got a great question from Jake Winbush. It really meant a lot as a young black kid who was obsessed with predominantly white sports to grow up watching you on TV, knowing you as Sal and now as Salema. What exactly made you start going by your full name when you're hosting and commenting events? Thank you, Jake. That's uh, really humbling to hear. Um, so last summer... Well, I've always wanted to to go by Salema. Um, but Sal was easy for people. When I first moved to California, when I, when I got to high school, I introduced myself as Salema, and kids were like, so what? That's fucking hard, bro. And I remember, like, after a couple of days, a kid like, coming up to me and being like, dude, we got it. We figured it out. You're Sal. <laughs> like, your voiceovers. They, they threw, yeah, your cat, your SoCal voice is yeah. really good as well. You Sal, bro. <laughs> yeah, you Sal, and it just whoosh, wildfire to the school. I remember the the next day, like walking down the hallway, people just being, like, "Hey Sal, yeah Sal, yeah Sal, what's up Sal? <laughs> Hi Sal." I'm like, "Huh?" But okay, everyone knew you. Acceptance, cool. I'm the new kid. People know my name, and um, I guess that's my my nickname now, and. When I got into television, um, 
I remember being like, all right, I wanted to say Salema. People can call me whatever they want, but I want my name on there. And in the beginning, that's what they did. They founded it as Salema Masekela, and people would refer to me on SL on camera, and that felt like cool. But for my family and everyone, be like, yes, look at my boy. They know him. That was Salema's my grandfather's name. That was my grandfather's name. And at a certain point, an executive came up to me when I was doing the NBA. I was like, hey, we got to talk. You know, you're killing it for us. We love it. Love it. Love the hair. Like, everything's great. You know, you're st- we love having you in your NBA. It's, it's awesome. We want to make you a star. And you, we got, you know, there are people in the Midwest. They're looking on the screen and they're saying, I can't, re- I don't know what that is. And then he literally, like, throws up the quotes and he's like, Sal Masekela, man. It's just easy. So let's go. And I, I remember that moment. I was about to go on camera. I was about to go. The game was, I was backstage in the press room, and I just remember being like, okay. And then that was it. It was done. And yes, it did take off. Like people could see it, boom, whatever. And it became the thing. But I never was com- comfortable with it. I would always introduce myself to people as Salema. And then I say, some people call me Sal. Um, but I wanted people to know my name. And ironically, girls would always be like, I like Salema. They're like, sweet. Um, run with that then. And <laughs> they all like, tell me more about your name. But it was just, I don't know, there was, it was that, that, I'll never forget that interaction with that executive. Um, and that's how, like, whatever, my brand of Sal Masekela happened. But I always felt like I, inside, I always felt like I'm, ma- I, I gotta, I'm changing shape to make myself more digestible. And I tried other times to change it back to Salema and your team, the people who are making money off of you, manager, agents, lawyers, were like, we can't do that. That's the brand. You can't fuck up the brand. I mean, at this point, it's established. You can't change the name of the brand. But I... Yeah, I'm the brand. And it was like when I cut my dreads. People like, oh, you can't do that. You're fucking up the brand. Like, well, if they're not listening to what I'm saying and you're telling me that people are just into me for, because I have dreadlocks, then maybe I should be doing something else for a living. It's still working now. But it was harder with the name, and I would let it go and let, let it go. Last summer, though, in the midst of everything, at the height of George Floyd, I woke up one morning and I said, you know what? If black people are going to continue to be accosted by and murdered by the people that we pay to protect and serve us, and society is going to continue to make excuses for it or justify it, then I don't think I want to be that digestible anymore. And it, it, I, I was sitting in my bed, and I got on my phone, and I changed everything. I changed everything in social media. I called my team. I didn't ask for permission. I dictated. Here's how this shit is going moving forward. I am Salema, and they will learn it. And then I went up on, on Instagram, and I was like, hey, everybody. Thank you for, for enjoying this page. From here now forward, you are going to refer to me by my name, which is Salema Mabena Masakela. Sal is no more. And uh, I tell you, I think I I walk, I, I feel like I grew five inches in the last year. Like this just no, I don't have this reason anymore to like try and like do any kind of like altering or like, octopusing to fit into a space. Um, Ironically, even though it's a space I've been in forever, but I feel like I'm getting to occupy it with my whole self as opposed to this thing that, like, was just easier for people to, like, digest. Mm. And when I did it, the amount of people, like, was his name? His name was Luke? Uh, Jake. Jake, sorry. Jake. Jake Wimbush. Mr. Wimbush. The amount of people like young Mr. Wimbush that sent me beautiful notes and DMs 
about what it was like to be a black kid or a person of kid of color that was in the in the sports that were considered white and how they had to adjust in order to be a part of these things and what it meant to them that I chose at this point in my life to do that. I didn't think that was going to happen. That was not what I was looking for. I was just, I just wanted to be, feel comfortable with myself and I still get that all the time. And I mean, to get it here on, on the show is, 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 is crazy, but it just feels good. Like I feel like I'm finally like, <sighs> like an ease and a peace. And, you know, I, I saw a meme the other day. <laughs> and it was about, like, people who have names that are, you know, not European derivative that people are like, oh, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> and it just said, uh, if they can say charcuterie, they can say <laughs> your name. <laughs> so true. <laughs> <laughs> And people find power in you being able to have your true name, you know? So it's so rad that you were able to do that. Yeah, it's been really cool. And now they can try to be their honest selves. And, and yeah. And that, that's really helped. Not that, not that I didn't understand before, but when you, over the course of uh, this conversation, mm -hmm. there's this common theme of you changing yourself a little bit to fit the person they want you to be. Let me just, oh, oh yeah, okay, I'm a little like, and now you're just like, this is me, motherfuckers. Yeah, take take it or leave it. Leave it. <laughs> take it or leave it. Right? And yeah. it's like, that's got to be, that's empowering for everybody. After years and years of, you know, like from the time that I was a kid, like trying mm -hmm. to figure out identity, you know, it's always, it, it, it literally took 49 years to finally be like, this, he, this is who I am. Take it or leave it. But like you said, I'm not going to adjust to sit at your table. And you shouldn't have to. And it feels damn good. Mm -hmm. When people say my name now, I'm just like, mm, say that shit again. <laughs> <laughs> it just feels, it, it. I'm so, like, when my favorite is when, like, someone, a fan who I've never met walks up and they're like, hey, Salema. I'm like, whoa. It, it's, I, yeah, yeah it's, mm -hmm. It's and pretty cool. One other thing, too. I mean, we we definitely have to talk about this because upon doing our research here for the show, I uh, I remember, you know, when you guys did the paddle out for George Floyd, and I remember watching it on Instagram on your feed, and and I haven't I hadn't revisited it since then. And there's a video on YouTube, and it is just like the the conviction in your voice, and it seems like you just grabbed the the megaphone and like something just possessed you. Like it just came from this deep place of conviction. And uh, it's just so powerful. The, the visual of the drone shot of everybody in the water and all that type of stuff. And so, you know, although there, there was some fucking horrific shit that happened. God damn it. That was beautiful. It was, it was really crazy, you know, and we like that time was, was nuts. You know, we were like a few months in the lockdown, like, um, and now, now <laughs> we got, we're in one crisis and now for some reason in the middle of lockdown, now we're just like, we're hyper-focused in, in this place and this conversation of, uh, of race. And it, it was, uh, when we planned the paddle out, it, I didn't think that people would come out, not in the way they did. And I remember driving down from LA back to Encinitas where we were, where we did it, where I grew up, you know, essentially for a big part of my life. And, you know, I'm hearing rumors that, like, the Proud Boys are going to show up and they, they talk on Facebook. Or they'd come down and, you know, the shit was popping at the time. Like, shit was wild last summer, right? And being like, so there was super nervous energy, and but we have to do this. And also no plan other than, like, we're doing this. And I remember when people started walking over the hill. And I'm like, they're with their kids. And they're, they've written all these names on their surfboards. And they made signs. And people are there and they're serious. And I, you see like a, a mother with a daughter or a father with a son or a whole family. And like they had conversations about why they were coming down to be a part of this thing. And it just was more and more people to the point where, like, 
holy shit, there's over a thousand people here. And when it was my turn to speak, I was so scared when I walked up to that megaphone. But as soon as I grabbed it, I just remember feeling this overwhelming peace. I didn't know what I was going to say, but there was this peace. And I just felt like my dad was standing right next to me. And, you know, my dad fought for these things his entire life. And fought with love. You know, not like he didn't want to fight you. He wanted you to see. And so I just, in that moment, I just remember being like, give some context to why you're here. And speak. And um, it was, uh, it was crazy, man. It was such a, I, I never in a million years thought that I'd like be out in the middle of the water with a thousand surfers, you know, cheering, screaming, you know, no justice, no peace. Or um, acknowledging with their whole chest that black lives matter as much as everyone else's. You know, the, even the, the longer conversation of people, hey, wait, you can't say that. Yeah, well, like, what about my your Save the Whales bumper sticker? You're going to scream about how dolphins too? No. You... you <laughs> I haven't heard that That's one a yet. Good, <laughs> I love the great analogy. You want the whales to live, and of course the dolphins. But right now we're talking about the, 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 whales. the whales because they're being decimated at a higher rate, and it doesn't make yeah. So that statement, like that statement, triggering people was really was 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 crazy, you know, during during that time. But to have a thousand. You know, or so white people screaming. I was like, what planet am I on right now? Like, this is the craziest day ever. Um, and it, it kicked off larger conversations in surfing that I never thought that we would start to have. And we're having them in snowboarding. We're having them right now. And none of, nothing changes overnight. But, you know, knowing that, like, this, 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 this is the jumping off point for hopefully something that looks a lot better and different maybe a decade from now, then um, that's my hope. It's just that, that we can continue to grow, um, grow the thing and grow the thing for everybody. That's beautiful. Now I, I'm curious as you're talking, I was listening, I was thinking about all these, all these damn huge pinnacle moments of your career, right? You've you know announced all these huge events and, you know, live TV and the biggest stage and, you know, and, and I would throw, you know, this, this paddle out for George Floyd speech, obviously in there too. Now, now out of, out of all these like massive moments of, of broadcasting and speaking to people, what's your, what's your favorite one? That's the most powerful moment. Yep. That's the personally most powerful moment that's the the greatest feeling of collective energy mm. collective shared energy and frequency that i've ever gotten to have in this thing and it 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 it's bigger than you know any of the best runs that i ever got got to co commentate or any of that so that's on its own side um just from an event standpoint i would say that you know getting to to do the Vulcan Pipe Pro um, on the North Shore and, and be a part of, of that kind of history in Hawaii was something that I'll never forget getting to be a part of. Um, and natural selection last year was like kind of the top of the mountain as far as to be in such a pivotal moment of like, oh, the whole shit just moved together. Like all of snowboarding globally just went like this. Mm -hmm. I remember we got off air um, after the championship and I was like checking my phone after the first day of competition and parents, more than one set of parents were sending me videos of their kids after watching the event and they made their parents go back into the backyard and build them 
their own backyard selection. Backyard nas- natural selection. You got you see these little like four and five, six year old kids like pretending like and emulating this thing in like in their backyards. And I was like, oh shit. This is this is literally a a a, a deep cut of for the culture and where do we go from here um and people being able to build relationship with the experience of the mountain right and wanting to build relationship with uh with 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 the mountain as opposed to just like doing tricks Mm -hmm. and it was just so cool to see a bunch of little kids being like we're doing our own backyard Selection, you know, um, the whole snowboard world is tuned into that too. Yeah, it that's was really just cool. Like all eyes on. Yeah, it. It was the biggest. Like I haven't, I don't think anybody's been as excited for that. No, but you know, I remember when Travis like pulled me aside like two and a half years ago. We were at Baldface. So he said, Can I talk to you for a second? I'm like, sure. Walk out onto the, onto the deck. I'm working on a thing, and going to pick up from the thing that we were doing a few years ago but it's going to be different and it's going to game change and tells me a little bit about it tells me the title he's like can i can i count on you i was like yeah of 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 course but also like you're talking to me about this thing that's years away and i i just remember i remember like his eyes like he's watching it already. Like you know, he's a he's a fucking freak. He's a freak. Like straight up freak. But the conviction that he had, without like raising his voice about what his intention was, I was just like, yeah, sure, whatever. Like I'm down. I can't believe you're asking me to be a part of it. But then on the back end of it, I just remember looking at him. We just both smiled and it's like, Whew. yeah, bro, you were not. <laughs> <laughs> you weren't kidding. You were not remotely. <laughs> Kidding, and I can't believe I just got to be a part of that. It's epic, <laughs> fucking unreal. Um, okay, we got a couple more things to to talk about here um, on my notes. Here, we got to talk about Alakazam. <laughs> Not, I don't know if everybody knows about Alakazam. So Alakazam is Masakela backwards, and it is um, the alias, the character that I make music under. Um, I grew up. Music was my first love, as we talked about. Um, but I never felt like I could make music in the way that I wanted to because I'm a Hugh Masekela's kid. <laughs> and who wants the, to hear a big Sal shadow? Ma- yeah, big, who wa- big shoes to fill. a slightly big shoes to follow. Also, who wants to hear a Sal Masekela record? Not me. <laughs> so um, when I left E, I was at a real crossroads where it's like, wow, that was... That was crazy four and a half years. What do I want to do now? I went surfing, took some snowboard trips, really took a breath and got out of like being in that. That energy was toxic, man. That celebrity world was wild. And then my cousin, Sonny Levine, came to me and he's like, hey, why don't you make that record? Why don't we make that record now? Because I'd sung back up for him on a bunch of projects and we had a studio together at my house that we lived in together when I first moved to L.A., and people would just be like, when are you going to make a, bro, when are you going to make your record? I'd be like, ah, no, it's fun to sing on y'all shit, but, like, make an album? No. And he literally, I call, he called me, he's like, are you done with your, like, shred, eat, pray, love? Because <laughs> I had just been gone and 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 shredding, and, and he said, let's, let's make that record. Commit to me two and a half months, and we're going to go, like, into deep fucking music school you already have the tools i'm going to surround you with great musicians we're going to write this thing together and um let's get this let's get this off your chest and out of you and i did i I remember i called my agent i was like so yeah don't bring me any jobs for like the next two and a half three months and they're like oh man he's clearly spiraling because his (laughs) show got canceled (laughs) um i I, you know he's losing oh we're losing him (laughs) Somebody get him a job. <laughs> Something big. He's not thinking clearly. We yeah. gotta get we gotta get somebody to talk to this guy. He is not thinking clearly. And they thought I was joking. And I was like, no, really, like, don't anyone bring me anything. This is I'm 
of course, like if you just got your show canceled and you tell everyone I'm going to make music now, they're just like, oh, <laughs> they've it's heard old. this before. I think <laughs> <laughs> the story <laughs> can't blame him for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I got it, but uh, I went to work and I didn't tell anyone anything. Didn't talk about it on social media or anything. I just, it was the most beautiful process, and um, made this 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 first album. And then I was like, okay, now what do you do with it? Like, what are you gonna call it? It was like three in the morning. I just like these vocals that I had been wrestling with. Finally nail it. I'm feeling. And suddenly, like hits the the talk back from from uh, out at the at the at the deck, uh, and I'm in the booth. And he's like. Shh. So, uh, this shit sounds fire. What are you, what, what are you going to call it? Like, what are you going to go by? And I was like, ooh, I didn't stop to think about that. And then I just said, I just remember being like, Alakazam. And he was like, yeah. And my dad had it as a license plate. It was A A L K S M, And I, a L A L K S E M because not, not enough letters. Letters. I think I was like seven or eight, and I asked him. I was like, "Daddy, what does that say?" What does that say? He said, "Look at it, man. <laughs> Look at it closely. It's your name backwards. Don't you ever forget it." And I was like, "Oh, that's us." And that came to me, and that's how Alakazam was born. And um, yeah, I've made two albums. I've gotten the tour. I got to play Afropunk in Paris and Bonnaroo. Um, and it's just been I played a bunch of shows in L.A. And it's just something that I it's it's the place where I get it was the first place I really got to be. Holy Salema was making the music. And I think it played a big role in the choices I started making as far as television and stuff was concerned. Like I, I, I flew dangerously close to the sun at E. And I was like all right, now we're never doing anything because we have to do it. It did end up yielding a lot of great fruit, but, like, from here on out, what are you going to do that makes you feel good? And this music, it just, like, puts me in a whole other space and place. And, you know, one of the first song that we dropped, I ended up getting on one of the closing episodes of Entourage. Sick. Scott Venner, who's, like, a super tastemaker musically I, I knew him from when I, our old MTV days when we were homies and he's super critical about music like he's a dick he's basically like Bridges musically like you know if you did something or you showed Bridges something ah that's terrible and here's why you should never do that again yeah. now let's go have a beer <laughs> you know fuck that that's how Al Venner was so I sent him the record being like okay well if it's shit He's not, he's going to take so much pleasure in telling you that it is. And I didn't hear from him for like two weeks. And he's like, I've been sitting with this and unfortunately it's really good. Unfortunately. <laughs> it's really good. And I can't believe you've just been sitting on this, like, and not doing anything with this talent. And then he hit me up and he's like, your song is in episode three of the final season of Entourage. I was like, what are you talking about? That's so dope. We hadn't even like figured out how we're going to put out the album. And now it's going to be on Entourage in three weeks. Um, and then, you know, a bunch of other shows, House of Lies, um, twice. My next album, I got a song on House of Lies. That was the closing song to the season premiere wow. of season five of, of House of Lies, which was huge. It played out for like three minutes and you're just like, What's happening? Um, and yeah, man, it's just it's the place where I I, I love to go, and um, probably gonna make another record here in in, in the next year or so. So Jeez, dope. Sounds dude, like it, you've done some stuff. Sounds sounds like it fills your bucket too. But yeah, going back does. as you're talking about how you got the closing song for Entourage, the whole time you talk about your agents and them freaking out about you playing music. It's ironic because I yeah I like to picture your agent like Ari Gold. So I'm like. <laughs> Like uh, in the That's team, like, oh, God, what's he doing? Oh, shit. What the fuck's he doing? Wait, what? He's got his song where? That's amazing. I was behind it the whole time. Yeah. I knew exactly what you were doing. You know, I got to make a song with my dad on the last record. Oh, wow. And I didn't tell my dad we were making the first album. I was deathly scared. And then he heard about it because 
my cousin Sonny's dad had been helping us with some stuff. My dad was in South Africa, and then he came he came over to do some shows, and he's like, "So, man, I hear you've been uh, working on a thing. When do I get to hear it?" And I was like, "Oh, man, I didn't get to tell him first. Fuck." I was like, "Well, we're mastering it or whatever," and he's like, "Okay, well, I'm here, man." So we went to dinner. I burned a CD for him. That was a disc that used to spin around that you'd put in a car and play music. <laughs> it's 2013, I think. Um, burned a CD from a, uh, of of the album, and we went to dinner at Jelena in Venice. And then afterwards, it was like a drug deal. He's like, "You got the thing, man." I said, "Yeah," and I pulled it out of my pocket, handed it to him, and he just goes, "All right, I'll talk to you soon." And he turned away and walked to his rental car. I didn't hear from him for two days. I'm fucking freaking out, like losing sleep. Because if he says, don't do it, I'm never going to do it again. He calls me up, and he said, man, I've been listening to this album for two days, man. And I can't believe that you've just been sitting on this this whole time. Man. Like, I forgot that you loved music this was, but I didn't know you could sing like this. He said, if I could sing like you... Then, you know, I wouldn't need my trumpet, man. I would just sing. I was like, what? And I just cried, man. That was just like, you know, to get to get the approval from your father, from your parents, but especially like the son-dad relationship is it's a weird thing, you know. Like he thought what I was doing was cool with, telev with television and, and, and action sports, and he was very, very proud. But to find relationship in his thing and to make something that, like, made him feel... That was uh, that was something else entirely. And then afterwards, he says, "But there's one thing." I was like, "What? Don't you ever make another fucking one of these without me, man? Why didn't you call me to play?" It's <laughs> <laughs> like, okay, <laughs> you were probably too scared to. Right? <laughs> I was petrified, you know. So the next album, um, I called him. I said, "We're we're we're doing." It. He's like, "All right, I'm coming." And he flew here from South Africa. Stayed for two weeks, and we did this song called In an Age together. And then, you know, he got diagnosed with um, with his second round of prostate cancer shortly afterwards and uh, lost him shortly after I put out the record, you know. But we made this beautiful song together, and we had so much fun and wrote this rap for him because he had this song um, called Don't Go Lose It Baby. It was a big, big hit in the clubs, in especially like in the English dance scene in, in the 80s. And he rapped on it. And I was in the studio with him when he was like doing the rap as a kid. And I was like, whoa, who are you? And so Sonny and I were like, yo, let's write him a fucking like Don't Go Lose a Baby style rap. And he came in and just crushed it. And then played all these beautiful horns, you know, in relation to my voice. We're like doing back and forth things. And yeah, it was just, it was just really, really, really special to have gotten that with him before. Before you transition. And I wish I could have met your dad. Oh, man. He was the coolest motherfucker ever. He sounds like he was the coolest mm -hmm. guy ever. Ever, ever, I ever. I love ever. hearing your voice impression of him, too. It just <laughs> takes me right to, like, picturing <laughs> picturing this guy. I I didn't even realize that I could do him until I, like, it came out one day. Yeah. And my dad said to me, because I would do it for my family, my sister, she's just like, you just give me chills every time, like you channel him. <laughs> so one day he said, "I hear that, uh, I hear that you do a, a me, man. Well, let's see it." And I was like, "I can't just do it on demand, man." Like, well, then I guess you can't do me then, can you? <laughs> 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 so I like broke it out and I started telling a story as him, and he fell. He was crying. <laughs> He was crying, like in tears, crying. Like that's the piece. Like I love you, man. Like that, that's just the fucking best. I didn't know that. What? This is. I should take you <laughs> everywhere now, man. And you can just speak for me. <laughs> so sick. <laughs> All right, we're gonna take a break and talk to you guys about the GoPro Hero Ten. We just got some of these bad Larrys into the office. These things are absolute hogs. Uh, the the stabilization on this thing, I believe it's called Stabilization Four Point is incredibly smooth you could film this thing uh you could be basically ragdolling down the hill uh full speed and if your arm was sticking out and it would look smooth you know what i like about this thing man. what do you like about it 
23 MP photos. That's huge, man. That's kind of almost bigger than my Nikon camera, mm-hmm. my full size DSLR that costs like seven grand. This thing shoots better quality photos. Um, also, is enhanced low light photos. That's Ooh. what you're going to want. If you're filming at the resort at night, you want that low light technology. What about the iCloud, bud? Dude, cloud connected. The second you plug it in, it starts downloading your footage, which is huge for a guy like me that kind of waits forever to download his footy. And Buds, you could actually use that on your big camera. I could use that on, on every device, please. <laughs> Thank you. Well, uh, if you're interested in getting one of these GoPro Hero 10s, the new best GoPro ever, comment on our YouTube. Head on over to our YouTube, the Bomb Holes YouTube, and on this episode, comment why you think you should have one of these, and that is where we'll pick our winner. And thank you guys, and thank you to the people over at GoPro, Davey Schmidt, for sending this over. We really appreciate you. Now let's go ahead and pivot into uh, talking about Pub Beer. So mm. they're a uh, huge oh. supporter of the show. I don't know mm. if this is gold anymore. Buds, you got one of those in front of you? I sure do. It's a great beer. Ah, oh, that timber all hits nice. How's it going down? Crisp, clean, and delicious. Their motto is hashtag cheap fun beer. Uh, it's affordable mm-hmm. price. If you're going to go, it's, you know, we're recording on a Friday. If you're going to go out and get absolutely shit house tonight, might as well pick up a 18 or 12, 12 beer, turn it into a zero pack. I might just do that. <laughs> exactly. Starting now. So uh, <laughs> turn it into a zero pack. We're going to go <sighs> ahead and uh, get into the pub beer crapshoot. Welcome to the Pub Beer Crab Shoot. So what you do, Salema, is just go ahead and give that thing a roll, and we'll tell you what you have to do upon whatever number you land on. The Goon Gear logo is a six. It's a three. three. Okay. Uh, What would your house party entrance theme song be if you could choose one? It would be... Hugh Masekela's The Boys Doing It. I can't wait to listen to that. Sounds like a heater. Sounds like an absolute heater. It's a fucking (laughs) straight-up banger. (laughs) (laughs) Is it a club banger or just more of a straight-up banger? It's, it's, I'm walking into a party. Okay. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, Mm -hmm. it's, this is not a normal party, and this is going to be one that I remember when I'm on my rocking chair. Mm. It's like a Project X kind of party. Yeah, like, it's, it's, it's a, it's a heater. Okay. It will definitely, it will definitely tone set mm-hmm. you, you knowing like, oh, this is this is different. Shit's going mm-hmm. down. Yeah, it's going down. Okay, we're gonna hit a fan favorite before we we uh, start wrapping this thing up, and that's hot takes. Now we like to ask our guest, um, you know, who the greatest of all time is in your opinion, both male and female. Who you got? Oh man, <sighs> you can't Louis Vito. Louis Vito is really good at kind of like. He's, he doesn't yeah, answer it. He he, 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 dodge, he dodges. Mm-hmm. He's professionally trained, media training. Greatest of all time, period, for me, Travis Rice. That doesn't mean anyone else less great. Doesn't mean that that position is not subject to change in the future. But for me, up until now, the greatest of all time is Travis Rice. <laughs> Um, the reasons are all there. I, I, I don't need to give you yeah. the receipts. Yeah. We all um, know. This is going to be controversial, but I still don't think that anyone has ever made a snowboard do what this woman made a snowboard do. Um, and her name was, is still Victoria Jalous. <laughs> Great answer. A couple times in here. Great answer. Greatest of all time. I just, for her time and being the, really the only one of like a a small handful of women in the backcountry uh, and big mountain riding, her riding was more than comparable. It, 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 it shone amongst the men in a way that, like, you had to, like, watch to learn. And her, she was just effortless, man. And and effortless and powerful in a way that just, like, yeah, all time. And just, yeah, it's just the shit. Great answer. Uh, inversely, we have another question. What is the worst trend in snowboarding? The worst trend in snowboarding to me has always been, like, trying not to look like a snowboarder. 
I'm always just like, that. Is that comfortable? I know you feel like you look cool and you look like you're in the streets, but like also you're snowboarding and it's cold out. So, yeah, but do you, do you, you know, go and, you know, go to the secondhand thrift store to buy a bunch of shit that doesn't work when you're on a mountain with frozen <laughs> water to look the coolest? Knock yourself all the way out. But if you're not spring riding, um, and you just want to be dressed like to to set yourself so far apart that you're also uncomfortable. I I don't feel sorry for you. I love that answer. And the problem is, you see all the kids emulate it, and then they're up on a powder day with a hoodie, yeah, or a also, sweater. Also, a big big trend happening. People don't wear goggles. Like yeah. I I, don't, I just goggles look whack. Yeah, I'm like you're you're fucking snowboarding. Yeah, if it's in the snowing. Snow. Too. <laughs> yeah. Guess what? My eyes don't hurt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And so I take great pride in my overall whackness. Uh, I want to take, I want to ride powder with Zeb Powell and see if if he can pull it off. If he'll just be, I just want to see him ride powder because oh, it would be the freak. He can pull anything off. Yeah. Could you imagine He's that? Just a natural. Can you imagine him like getting the ways of the back back force? <gasps> I'm sure we're gonna see it. It's right? coming. Yeah, it's coming. Also, you know, Does he sidebar ever wear goggles. No, yeah, no, he wore, but he wear, he at least wears glasses, glasses. sunglasses. Yeah. sunglasses. He, that shit. He, uh, he's also in a class of zone because it's he he's one of those guys like Rene that just the yeah. Improv is at Could the you? I level. the other day I was thinking about like what if it was just a movie of Zeb and Rene, mm -hmm. like a like a like a versus like a like a that like a cool. like a day one. Um, what am I thinking of? Day one song and Roddy. Mullen. Oh, those are classic. Yeah, the verses. Yeah, but like, could you imagine just? This, like, give all the money to, like, a really dope filmmaker. Rene and Zeb, see you next year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Fuck off. Would, you know what they're in, right? I was blown. thinking about this, you know, in the fucking staring at the old scroll hole, watching scroll. Rene ride. He's in Sauce Fay. Or was oh, watching, I was I've watching been watching Chuck that shit. roast on these jumps. And it's like they've reached this, and Zeb, throw them in the same category. Also probably throw a Cleveland steamer in there, too. But I even would give Fridge some of that as well. Some people would be like, "No, you give him too much credit." But yeah. I think that the I think the Fridge is is amazing. But he's continue. a freak. But I don't know if I'm going to put him in that category. But yeah. he's a freak. But anyway, so you you go, um, you know, these guys. It's like they go they go off the jump, and it's like they their confidence is so fucking high. They've reached this level of I can do whatever the fuck I want on my snowboard mm -hmm. that is so high that. I think they can literally just go off and like heave themselves in any direction. Do anything. And it's like, and that's kind of the cool progression because a lot of it's very structured, like back 10, back 14, back 18. And it's like, these guys are like, no, I'm just going off. Jazz. Flinging. Jazz. <laughs> jazz. <laughs> jazz. Those motherfuckers. I would call the movie Jazz. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they kind of, it seems like they decide when they're on the lip, too. You go, it's just like, yeah, like, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm just going to kind of... How about this? Slow this way, <laughs> yeah. and then flip, and then I'm, I'm definitely going to land on my feet, no, no matter, matter what, what happens. Yeah. Like, I know, I know I'm going to land on my feet. And Rene and Zeb are like, they're over here mm -hmm. yeah. by, by themselves. And it's like, there's... So cool. It's also, these jumps are so big and dangerous that when you're actually there in real life, you're just like, what? Oh, well, <laughs> yeah. I don't think I'm, I'm actually going to go around this one today, I think. And Forever. Always, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's been a long time. <laughs> I couldn't make it to the fucking knuckle. No. With all, if, if, if there was a firing squad at the top, <laughs> like, you just got to point it and go. I'd rather be shot. Huh? Yeah, just, just pull the trigger. <laughs> Pull the trigger. It'll hurt way less. <laughs> you know what? I'm actually going to opt to be shot. Can I opt for you a shot now, please? It'll, it'll hurt less than actually going off this job. <laughs> Can you just shoot me in my foot at least? Please. Something like that. Yeah, maybe I'll get a chance to ride again. <laughs> uh, so another thing before we wrap it up, I know you got an awesome new surf company. Mm -hmm. And tell us fucking what's going on with that. And also Afro Surf in that same category. Yeah. Because they kind of go hand in hand. They right? do. So I started working on a brand out of South Africa called Mami Wata in 2018. And I was in South Africa visiting. My, my dad was sick, and so I was spending a lot of time uh, with his treatment, et cetera. And a friend of mine, uh, a, a footwear designer from South Africa, this woman named Maria McCloy, was like, you got to meet these guys in Cape Town. They're doing something that I think you'll be psyched on. She knew I surfed. And it was Mami Wata. And they made this little five-minute short called Woza. 
and she sent it to me, and I just so like, wait, what? It was the first. It was a. It was a, a sort of an artistic surf film. Um, that was it featured a, just a, a black South African surfer, and I'd never seen that before. So, and it was beautifully shot and 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 cool. Um, and so I was like, I got to meet these guys. And they were operating this little brand. Um, and the idea was to sort of look at, at, at surfing through the lens of, of, of Africa instead of just like SoCal and, and Australia. And I was like, yes. And they're like, we wanted to take this thing to the States. And I was like, yes. So we started building and they made me a co-founder and we started working in the last three years to bring it here to the States. And, um, you know, everything is sourced locally uh, in South Africa. Um, all of it's handmade in South Africa and it just like to be able to have this uh, this idea of surf culture, which people always think of traditionally as like blonde hair, blue eyed, shaka bro. But you got the largest continent on the planet, surfable surfable continent on the planet in in in, in Africa. This idea of being able to showcase a different lens of what surf culture feels like through African culture was very, very appealing to me. Like, my dad's whole MO, you know, and later in life was about getting people to appreciate Africa in the same way that they do Europe and Southeast mm. Asia and all these other cultures that they, like, want to check off the box that they went and experienced and engaged with the people and ate in the food. But when they go to Africa, it's like, we went on safari and we climbed Kilimanjaro and... We also donated to a well, and we're doing everything we can to help those poor Africans that are suffering. That's the extension of, like, people's knowledge of the largest continent on earth. And when my dad passed, I was like, well, how do you even carry that legacy forth? He did it with music. And then you realize, like, oh, shit, it's right here with surfing. And so we started talking about, a book called Afro Surf, the idea of like doing a coffee table book that showcase the whole thing is like surfing th through African, the lens of and the diversity of African culture. And then for some reason, it made the best sense during um, lockdown to be like, let's do it now. And it took all the ego out of it from an art direction standpoint or from a production standpoint of having to be in each country and really taking advantage of the relationships and giving people a template and helping curate the telling of the stories and then editing. And we put it, we did a Kickstarter uh, last year in the fall and sold 1,400 books. All of the profit goes towards two organizations in, in South Africa that promote art, art as therapy, excuse me, surfing as therapy. Ways for Change, and another one called Surfers, Not Street Children. And you know, 1400 bucks at $60 pop, boom, all to those organizations. Um, and this idea of, like, helping as, as surfing is exploding in, in, in Africa and across the continent, making it so that what surf culture looks like, looks like is dictated by the people who live there and, and communities, surf communities being built into the culture as opposed to, like, just expats that move from, like, Australia or the States to be, like, set up shop, build a camp, and be like, I'm in charge of the surfing here, but I've given jobs to the local people. Enough of that. It's rooted in, like, all sorts of, like, problematic historical things and context. And um, the book did so well just off of the Kickstarter that we started getting calls from, like, real book publishers. And we finally made a deal with um, a publisher called Ten Speed, and um, it, it we've did twenty thousand books this summer. Wow! Holy shit! Um, yeah, it's been it's been wild. Um, and your goal was like five hundred, right? When you started, the yeah. Kickstarter. <laughs> when we started Kickstarter, it was like five hundred. We did fourteen hundred, and now twenty thousand. And um, so it, it's been great momentum, and the way people have reacted to it, being like, I never thought I would ever see Africa this way. There's so much I didn't know, and then it also happens to be through surfing. Like, seeing people's brains get blown that way is beyond anything that I could have imagined, uh, that we could have imagined as a team. And now, um, 
you know, we were launching the brand here. Um, people were able to get it, but we were shipping from just from South Africa. We'll be doing it from here as well. And, you know, putting some oomph behind it. So we, we, we uh, announced the launch this week and it's exciting. It's exciting to be like at the helm of a, a surf brand. I've worked for so many brands, you know, I had the privilege of, 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 of doing a brand that was done by, by all people of color in alpha, alpha, alpha numeric, but we never got to see it through to its full potential. Um, we made a huge impact on the in- industry, but never got to see it through to its full potential. And this feels like picking up, um, picking up where that left off, but at the right time, um, really at the right time, and to do so uh, through surfing is uh, is exciting. So yeah, Mami Wata Surf. The website launches. Um, well, by the time this airs, it'll it'll the it'll American website will be up. Yeah, that photo of the surfboard and the horse. Yeah, man. Is that you? No, it's uh, not me. You, did you take the photo or something? I saw maybe credit, photo credit. Uh, they just, just it was put it together. That the press release was uh, through a variety, and I gave them the, oh, okay. the photo. But um, it's courtesy of yeah, Oslema, I guess is what it said. But it was crazy. Such that, a cool photo, though. It's so cool, so powerful, and um, yeah, that kind of imagery around a, a, a surf lifestyle brand. Like yeah. there's plenty of surf lifestyle brands, but not one that comes from this end. And hopefully, it can. My goal is to like. The idea of what people think of as a surfer being not something they can just pick up out of out of the lineup, mm-hmm. you know. That's great. Great. And there's there'll be more African American people that are like, oh, he looks like me. I can do that. I can yes. get in a water. Oh, I can yeah. do that. Too. I didn't even know I could do that. And, and people that's, are going to want to go surf those breaks. I imagine. Yeah. Too. If it can create tourism, and if it can make someone feel seen, and I think that's the thing that people back in our other part of the conversation where you know people get sort of triggered and touched about race. It's like not being able to understand that like if I can see myself represented in a thing, then it's possible. Mm -hmm. And the majority of people not knowing what that feels like or that it's even a feeling. I remember the first time someone walked up to me and said, yo, I watch X games and I started snowboarding because you were there telling me what it was. And if you could be there and you're the only person who looked like me, I was like, all right, I get to, I, I'm going to go try this thing that I didn't know was for me. And I'm like, what? Um, yeah, this idea of like, you know, representation matters. Being seen gives, allows you the possibility for a thing to exist. And it, it cuts across so many different lines, right? Whatever, race, faith, um, gender, like, if I see see people that 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 embody what I embody and they're there, like I can do it too. That's mm-hmm. why it was for me for snowboarding. Mm-hmm. You know, the first time I saw a picture of, of when I, that that photo issue on the round rail, mm-hmm. that board slide. Oh, that photo is like such a classic of Russell. When I saw that shit, I have, I was at Transworld working. I screamed when I opened up the magazine. I, up until that point, I didn't know that there were any black snowboarders let alone a black pro snowboarder with a two-page spread in the photo issue, which was so curated. I immediately cut that shit out and put it up on my wall. And I wouldn't meet him for a few years later, but that gave me lift to continue just seeing a photo and being like, oh, I, scre- I remember being like, yo, this dude's black. <laughs> People were like, we know. <laughs> <laughs> Unreal. Well, man, we've been, we've been doing it for a minute here. Um, you know, before we get out of here, I just got to ask, what's what's next for Salema? What do we got in the future? What does the future hold? I'm trying to turn Afro Surf into a show, uh, a travel show, to take out and, and literally take people to Africa through this lens. And um, I've never felt more excited at the possibility of being able to sell something like this. Um, so I'm excited about that. Um, I got a memoir in in the works. Oh fuck yeah, sick! Uh, which is basically like saying I'm I'm planning to climb Mount Everest without boots. That's what it feels <laughs> like. But uh, I have a really cool um, publisher, a woman who's like really just won't let me hide from it. So uh, I'm in that. And um, Hume Supernatural. My de- deodorant company, I'm having a blast at. Um, we do uh, this natural deodorant called Hume that we launched last year, and it's killing it. 
In fact, we just got we got to get some for the podcast and do some shit with with y'all. Yeah, y'all will love it. Where can you guys find, where you find it? What's your website? Uh, humesupernatural dot com. H u m e supernatural dot com. Send some. I should have brought some. I'm a shitty guest. Oh, good. But we'll 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 get some sent to you. And you know, finding cool ways that make sense for who I am today to tell stories in a in a manner that can really connect up with people and maybe contribute to some some healthy ways in which we engage each other. If I get to to stay close to to snowboarding as a voice and to surfing a, and skateboarding as a voice, I will be very very grateful. But I also don't I don't have any expectations of, you know, continuing to be the guy. You know, like when it's time to sit back I'm here for it, you know. I'm so happy that there are so many other voices. Like, I'm so stoked that we have a Stan, you know. Uh, um, and I, I, he's someone that I've, I've taken under my wing a bit because I, I really believe in him. He's so brilliant. I did not have what he has uh, at 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 his time, and and you know, I'm excited for what the future voices look like across the landscape, you know. And any way that I can help to assist. And maybe help, uh, you know, f- former pros or, you know, athletes, men and women that want to, like, get into the storytelling game for the culture. Like, yo, I'm here. Hit me up. Like, I, that's what I, I, I want to uh, continue to see uh, more of. And I'm always going to, I'm going to ride till I can't ride anymore. Um, but I, I just want to make sure, like, I don't try, I'm not, not staying at the party too long. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> hey, uh, yeah, you kids, you guys, you guys got this. I'll, 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 I'll be over here. Man, I hope you don't stop, uh, stop, yeah, retire stay, from stay the being party. the voice, the voice of Snow Running Leaves, too. It'd be like, uh, like we won't know what the fuck to do when you stop announcing <laughs> this shit. We're gonna be, uh, <laughs> There'll be plenty of people who'll be like, <laughs> fucking finally. <laughs> So, so uh, one other kind of self helpy question that I want to ask before we get out of here. If you could go back to your younger self when you were kind of squirming around uncomfortable in your skin, say maybe age 18, what would you say to yourself? What advice would you give yourself? I would tell myself that um, you're never going to have it figured out. And that's quite all right. So enjoy the journey. Fucking great advice. banger. Love it. Well, Salema, thank you so much for coming on our show. Ah, man. It's been a real pleasure. You guys, you know, I started getting, I think it was maybe last year, you guys would like, I started to notice when when you'd ask in in the socials, like, you know, who should we have on the show? And I would, you know, see myself tagged, and I I was really blown. I was like, wait a minute, like, to me, I look at this podcast, at this at this discussion as like it, it is literally like the it's like the, the storehouse of, of like of, of the culture, you know, um, and what you guys do and the and the manner in which you're preserving the past and also showcasing the now is so necessary in a time when like you know the magazines and all those things that that mattered, the landscape has changed, but this is like a definitive place that everyone knows they can come to from all different angles of the thing. And so to, 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 to see, like, my name in the midst of all these people, it was, I was just like, wait, what, huh? Yeah, me? You know? Um, and people would be like, you, you know, when, when's that going to happen? I'm like, I, listen, <laughs> there are so many people ahead of me. <laughs> if it ever happens, I'll, I'll, I'll be stoked. But I just, I've just been so stoked to be able to be a fan and to watch – what you guys have built. So to be able to come here, um, it's just a real, real honor, man. And I'm immensely proud of you guys. And thank you. This is so stoked. You came out. Yeah, man. Man. Full circle, like a motherfucker, bro. (laughs) (laughs) Appreciate those kind words. Slim. It means a lot. And I want to say thank you so much to our listeners, uh, our Patreon members, our sponsors, um, everybody in this snowboarding community, even if you're not even in the snowboarding community, anybody that listens to this podcast, Thank you, and uh, we will see you next week over and out from the bomb hole.